Welcome to another episode of By the Numbers. I'm your host, Richard Lewis. Joining me, as he always does, is the eSports historian. It's Duncan Torrent Shields. And strangely upbeat t- tonight. Honestly, We've anyone got who's Saudi deep. who's watching the episode, don't take the name too literally. It's by, like, B-Y the numbers. Oh, not, yeah, yeah. Not B-U-Y. You know, <laughs> you know, you guys think everything for sale nowadays. <laughs> As we see, he's, he's, we're there coming in go. hot on this All one. Right. Uh, right, so just before we do, uh, let's just get the sponsors as far away from everything Duncan's about. Oh, exactly. As as <laughs> <laughs> just, let's just keep the sponsors for another week, Duncan. So obviously we've got a VPN sponsor. Go to nordvpn.com slash RLS and you get like 74% off, I think it works out as. Definitely want to get yourself a VPN. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's everyone that might might be interested in your data is coming into the space. Uh, and of course, uh, yes, our uh, peripheral uh, sponsor, Steel Series, fantastic uh, product, fantastic company. Uh, go to the Steel Series store, and you can use Richard Lewis or one word uh, to get ten percent off anything that is there. So let's um, let's set the table. So obviously, I'm sure everybody watching now is more than aware of the Saudi Arabian Public Investment fund it uh having created a company called savvy gaming uh, and they have acquired esl for one billion dollars face it for half a billion dollars and obviously this essentially locks up uh the counter-strike scene and potentially beyond a huge acquisition in the space we did a podcast uh what we call the four horsemen with monte cristo we had the co-founder of face it come on and explain some components of the acquisition and also stand there while duncan fucking roasted his face off for a bit so good good on michele he's always been a good sport like that uh and we strongly urge you to go and seek that out and go watch that because we don't want to rehash all the same stuff in this podcast so what I want to focus on is more the minutia because this is a CS focused podcast. And I'll just ask you, Duncan, right out of the gate, sort of what the future might look like. Because I imagine it's hugely concerning that a company that occupies 80% of the calendar that look to be at one time hemorrhaging so much cash, they might have to compromise on that. And now not only have they consolidated financially, they've consolidated and concentrated power by bringing in face it who were ostensibly a rival even though they were doing less and less events these days so in the immediate future uh what are your thoughts about the deal and kind of what it does to the scene yeah the main concern for me it's very similar to how you set it up is that not only do you have a, a group that essentially for me they were this close to what I would call a functional monopoly. You'll notice that Mick yeah. went out of his way to address what a literal monopoly would be and didn't ever address what a functional one is because that was the sort of game that he was playing on that episode. But whatever, as Richard says, at the end of the day, it's not like you can just wreck them over every fucking word they say. He's only going to be able to say the things he can talk about on the episode and other things you'll notice he stayed silent about because obviously it would have done him no good or even us for that matter. He'd just get pulled off the show, wouldn't he? So it's certain thing he couldn't talk about. What yeah. I would say is this, with the money they have now, they effectively do have a functional monopoly on CSGO. And the reason I say that is, look at who signed up to the Louvre Agreement. Basically everyone locked in for many, many years. I would imagine they have, if you think about what WISA used to do when you wanted to leave, you have to pay hundreds of thousands back. I'd imagine they have incredibly hefty penalties if you ever leave that Louvre Agreement. I'd imagine mm-hmm. they were probably even stupid enough to own Team Orgs to take a little bit extra scratch on the way up. And then you get a big bite out on the way back down if you leave, all thinking like pro players that they employ. Well, that'll be never be me who leaves because it's a great initiative. So they're all morons don't worry about that. everyone in esports is just a different gradation of moron they're a moron 15 years older who knows a little bit more about the team orgs maybe so my problem is this in the world where basically they own esl entirely kit and caboodle first of all i don't think people get this there is now no reason esl ever has to negotiate with blast they can say to blast yep. you come on our terms we give you these months this is how you're going to structure it and how you're going to be framed on contrast rules and if you don't by the way not only can we say make a choice teams and spoiler right now they'd have to choose esl they would just have to but even worse 
We got a billion to burn through. Oh, you wait on the ropes, eh? Do you have to succeed in the next year? Do you have to take a deal, a smaller deal, like Neom, for example, to stay alive? Spoiler, I can just I can just burn through 500 mil while you figure out the next few years. So let's go to war. Basically, if they want to have a cold or a hot war, ESL wins that war because it's like, if people don't get it, the current state of the CSGO circuit is like those old-fashioned poker games from Wild West movies, where instead of using the modern no-limit rules, where if I go all in for $10, it just takes 10 out of your pot of 100 and you do the 10 separate pot in the old wild west people will famously know it was the main plot mechanic of these movies if you have the best hand and you bet ten thousand dollars but then the other guy goes well i put my whole bar and, uh, and ranch on it now you have to go and get the money to even do your hand otherwise you have to fold that's it the game's over and the joke is that is what esl can now do to everyone else in the csgo space no one has anywhere close to cash injection cash reserves and quite frankly i would imagine pipeline very convenient and applicable word in this sense pipeline of funds from god knows where in saudi arabia pumping into the company so at this point in time if you know anything about predatory behavior of people who are close to monopolies it isn't like they presented on that show and i'm sure hltv's interview with esl must imply like now they're going to be more magnanimous and benevolent and now you know the pressure's on all the way around dumb fuck now they are going to put the fucking hurt on people in this industry and here's another thing i'll say i remember another functional uh, monopoly that occurred Richard it was a company called Twitch and what happened was it was already number one you might see a track record going in then it had this counterbalance called Own TV and for a while it all worked like that like they owned had its own clients maybe they overpaid for certain ones then Twitch had their people and for a while they kept each other in check and they were both growing the industry then what happened was Twitch just took over they had this massive monopoly YouTube chose not to heavily counter them and just took small positions kind of like uh, trying to be the niche player in the industry essentially just have their foot in the door for maybe later and what happened as a result of that i'll tell you what happened People got worse deals from Twitch. People got retainers taken away from Twitch. People were even fired from Twitch. Like, basically, the joke is they got more ruthless when they had the monopoly, not less. The joke should be, there's a, remember, they always use this fucking terminology. There's this enormous pie, and now we can just share it out to everyone. No, the joke is they get an even bigger portion of the pie. You get an even smaller one, and if you don't like it, it is the only pie. There is not even another one to go to. You have to take their deal. So I actually personally, this just isn't a great sign for me at all. I know in the short term, a lot of fans will think of the very selfish side, which goes like this. With the money and resources they have and essentially complete control, ESL could, if they had some very brilliant creative people, do some amazing shit for the next couple of years of CSGO. They could make the circuit everyone always wanted. The problem I would say is this. If you look at the types of business people at ESL, the decisions they made already that sometimes weren't actually predicated just on saving money and staying alive, that's a very bullshit excuse to use. Because by the way, a month ago, they wouldn't have pretended they were out of money and all. They, they, that's, they've just wrecked on their whole history like basically i don't unfortunately believe that these are people who are good actors and going to do great things i imagine you get some positives out of it look if they have more money to spend on the tournaments we can do a lot better things it's just i would imagine it will all come with extra costs elsewhere i imagine it'll hook teams into a more permanent system and quite frankly as i said on that episode the difference between our game and other games is in other games you all deal with the game dev ESL's just trying to get all the money that the middleman would do in the game devs in a sense. But then they're not even the game devs. So I, I personally see a, a very dark future for the game. And I think you're going to see, I imagine, Rumor's talent will still work with them and all the teams, etc. But like, put it this way. If one of the coolest things about CSGO I always thought compared to League of Legends is in League of Legends, I have to sometimes tweet, like send a message to mates of mine like, oh, watch out about saying that publicly, mate. Like, you might not know this, but I know Riot won't be happy. That I don't have to do that in CSGO. In CSGO, yeah. they can go fucking Valve's head at the major and you know that no one's getting fired. No one's getting... Like, we're in a world now, I'll just phrase it this way, and this is going to sound like a hilarious joke until you realise it's just factually true. Essentially, the Saudi Arabian government, if you have the ESEA client, have now machine code level access to your PC. Welcome to the fucking dystopian nightmare. We're playing fucking video games. They could just be reading literally what's on your computer. That's the world we now live in. I know as they implied, like, well, we work with the anti-cheat as well. Oh, great. Br brilliant. Yeah. Might as well just uninstall my firewall, then shall I fuck me? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, like, so my, my initial thoughts are like as to where this goes. It's, it's like kind of hard to say uh in it like sort of at the moment because you'll notice that bar one or two people no one's really said anything oh, from a broadcast no, radio talent perspective. yeah no one said it from a rival perspective 
uh you know like nobody's like you know i mean back in the day when like mtg dreamhack and esl were all at each other's throats one of them would have put a tweet out going if you want to come and support the non-saudi owned esports company yes, yes you know but there's none of that because ev who knows who's even going to be next remember Sav the savvy gaming group have said they are looking to spend 30 of billion yeah of course 30 billion over the next five years the the way I see the lay of the land currently, you could probably buy up the whole industry for that. Uh, you know, bar the, what's controlled directly by the uh, games developers. You know? weird, one thing we didn't even get into on that episode because it was so much about the other aspects is I personally think they overpaid for ESL, mate. If you think about what ESL was worth, no, they MTG, massively have. It's if you think absolutely not worth it. Was willing to accept. By the way, it was like forty four million, I think it was, or something yeah. at the beginning of twenty twenty. The joke is you could have probably got this for half price or maybe even less. So that, to me, there's the problem, guys. People who have a massive amount of money aren't idiots who throw money away for no reason. If they spend it, they have a calculated reason why. So in my opinion, the reason you spend that amount of money is you do have some, you have some ideas that people wouldn't want to fucking put through otherwise, but you make the numbers so crazy, they all think they have to accept it. By the way, shout out to the whole esports industry who are now going with mad l reasoning, like, well, for a billion though. Well, you know, everyone has to have a job. It's like, well, so they, essentially, I'm the idiot again, because it sadly is the life of an autistic person, mate, going, Richard, they don't even have rules. And it's like, well, yeah, they don't. They're just scumbag. No, but they're not even holding to their rules, Richard. What about the rules? And then it's just me getting wrecked over and over again, caught in a fucking loop of logic in it. I've, I've, told, I've told you many times. So like, sad, but... isn't it? I, I'm, I, I'm like fucking Charlie Brown. I'd fucking go for that football every time. She has to hold it this time, Richard. She promised. Every I... fucking time, I know. So, so we'll talk a little bit about broadcast talent and what they might do. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some comedy uh, stylings uh, coming in, in that uh, segment. But the other thing is as well, I like that there is there is an inarguable element of duplicity that's gone on in, in this. And let let me clarify what I mean by that. ESL um, certainly, and Mick didn't say it either on the on the Full Horseman podcast. It seems to me inarguable they have tried to get all of their ducks in a row before doing this because they knew it would be deeply unpopular. In fact, there are too many coincidences. Now, Rem first distant of, all, of the Neom LEC thing, if yes, people don't know, exactly. they even internally, Richard's reporting actually discovered this. It's on Deserter. You can go search it. Basically, he found out that it wasn't like some happy coincidence they tried to no. do the deal with Neom right after the Pride tour. They did it intentionally, guys. They just essentially said, like, this will look bad if it goes out now and just delayed it. Then just did the whole Pride thing. We're like, right, have all, have all the flags gone away? Okay, right. Right now, the Neom's here. Like, Essentially, yeah. there's something of that probably going on here, right? Seems well, yeah. likely. So, so let's let's be clear. Here's all of the things that happened in the build up to this deal, and a deal of this size doesn't just get because yeah. remember, ESL are a public company, so ESL have to go. All of the shareholders have to talk about it. They have to agree with Vote the price. Yeah, 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 exactly. You, you know what I mean? So, um, so here's here's what happened in the build up. So they announced GG for All, the all-women's uh, tournament publicly. I'm sure you remember that. They uh, extend the Louvre agreement, uh, which is the contract they have, essentially a kind of mini franchising agreement with all the big organizations to be part of the ESL circuit. And they didn't just agree it, they extended it to 2025. They wrapped up the Intel sponsorship deal until 2025, and by extension, uh, all the any key partnership comes with that as well. And they held talks with Valve to agree to get the second major of the year with a pers uh, prospective view to hosting it in Rio de Janeiro. All of that happened prior to this announcement. Now... My read on that is it's because they have a, a, a very clear understanding of how deeply unpopular being owned by the Saudi Arabian government is, how unpalatable, unpalatable it is with most people. And so they've attempted to get, get all those deals extended into the far future. So it becomes almost impossible to untangle yourself from them, even if you want to. And I would imagine... A lot of the parties that have had the wool pulled over their eyes there, they're gonna I think they'll feel aggrieved about it, mate. I really do. I, I think I think if I'm one of those teams, 
you know, well, now I'm along for the ride because you've made me sign to, until 2025. Maybe I would have wanted to go to another franchise league. Maybe I would have given Flashpoint another go. You know, well, I don't know what the option... Maybe I might want to commit more to Blast now. Maybe I might want to just withdraw from the Louvre agreement on principle. You now don't have that option, not unless you want to lawyer up and try and entangle yourself from an incredibly long three-year agreement. One of which, by the way, I'm sure is incredibly financially lucrative and left you scratching your head going, why are we getting so much out of this? Now you know. Now you you know where the money's coming from. Equally, I can't imagine Intel are too happy about it because an American corporation loves nothing more than to be able to fucking virtue signal, like as we've talked about. Being able to, you know, push woke capitalism as if such a thing can actually exist is hugely desirable in the current economic landscape. It's it's a viable marketing strategy uh, and it works and that's why they do it. Not because they care, not because they have any principles. They're a corporation. Profit is the principle. So I'm sure they're going to feel feel aggrieved because when you lose a little bit of cultural capital like that you what you want a heads up from your business partners as you've rightly stated on twitter any key are in an absolute fucking nightmare <laughs> position because how the fuck are you going to be partnered with a fucking uh, entity that is owned by a government that imprisons and kills people for being gay so, I did a joke, but this is a real thing. It's a factual. Last, uh, no, it's two years ago. It was in 2019 when I did the event ESL New York. ESL, in partnership with AnyKey, demanded that all talent who worked the event sign an AnyKey pledge yeah, privately so only in the most sinister fucking Soviet-style fashion I've ever seen, just to be held on record. Presumably, by the way, the obvious cynical read would be if you then said something off-colour, they mm. they've got you in your own words promising not to do it so you can hang you out to dry and you can't say shit about it so here's the irony of the event the same company that didn't even make you have a contract to work with them made you sign a pledge which said you would never say anything sexist you know uh, fucking uh, what, what anti-lgbt whatever you know all that all the jazz you'd expect at this checklist the joke is the owners of esl wouldn't be able to sign the any key pledge in good conscience otherwise they'd be liars do you not see how this makes your entire initiative absolutely hollow words even yep. worse worse than that not just hollow words explicitly the opposite of what you're pretending to be you're yeah. pretending to be someone who advocates for in this case gay people or women and then you're going and saying i will take money from people who i would agree before i take the money actively harm these entities and in doing so i ensure i will never speak out about it so i won't even do the most basic fucking level that those morons like the risk claim which is i was starting a conversation the joke now is you're going to be the one ending a conversation going well i have to eat don't i and like as though that's how you want your fucking heroes to go about thinking ah well i've got to pay that rent though haven't i so maybe i better stop this march fucking hell give me a break so, so i mean for me I, like listen I, i'll say this because I, I i know a couple of the people over at any key and uh i i i think i think that this puts them in a difficult position i mean put it this way i would wager now uh, what i can tell you from sources i've spoke to uh is that there's a ton of what they call fucking town halls going on virtual town halls which are basically just open q a sessions with the executives with the management answering any questions or concerns people will have i will wager that there is a a, a, a big showdown meeting coming between any key and esl and i'm pretty sure intel as well are, are not going to be happy um We'll get to this Carmack interview in a bit where he, he talks about that. But first, we'll get the talent stuff out the way. Um, and look, we'll try and be as lighthearted about this because these people are our colleagues, in some cases our friends. Um, but so far, I mean, look, and also I think it, it's worth pointing out, not, I don't expect everyone to come out and say what I'm saying or what you're saying or what Vince said. I'm not expecting all of the talent to like make a statement about what they think about the current lay of the land geopolitically and, you know, whether I'm willing to walk away from a big pile of money or not, you know? I mean, you don't have to do that. And most of the time, by the way, you know, the, the vast majority of talent have never morally grandstanded yes. anyway. What they want to do is just rock the show. And that's fine. Like, obviously, for people in our position, me and Duncan, well, it's a, it's a two pronged thing. First off, as a journalist, I sort of have to walk a very clear ethical line. I've set myself that standard. Without my rules, there's not much of Richard Lewis, really. That's That's how I have to live to make sense of everything I've done with my life to date. And equally as well, I've, I've been fortunate enough to get myself in a position where I can do that and not starve 
uh and, and you know god bless god bless to the community that have helped me achieve that so and it's much the same for you can you imagine the mockery and the derision if you ever took a single solitary penny off the saudi arabian table you would be fucked for life. You would be held up as, uh, you know, oh, you claim to be a paragon of virtue and now you're just a hypocrite like all the others. And somehow your hypocrisy would be the worst hypocrisy of all. Of um, but so I'm not expecting everybody to make a statement. I think some have painted themselves into a corner and now we, now we have to wait and see what they do. And obviously the obvious one, and I saw, look, I'm not trying to dogpile anyone when they've got like, you know, just had a kid or, or, or whatever. Um, you don't have to turn the internet on. It, it, yeah. If you're really fair. busy, just don't turn the internet on. Just, just enjoy but, having a kid. You know, look, I'll I'll just say, obviously, me and Frankie are mates. And, uh, you know, I, 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 this is why I tell talent, just be careful about which cause you very publicly go on because you really don't have an idea where it's going to take you in the future. And unfortunately, in esports, you end up fucking... You can end up in some weird spots. It's a, it's a growth industry. So obviously she's in a position now where, you know, she's publicly tweeted out in the past saying it's time to educate ourselves and why we shouldn't work with people who would kill our friends. Very bold stance about the neon deal. And unfortunately, and even some Sam would say, I mean, it's pretty, you know, you've, you've put your cards on the table. Let's yeah. not work with people who would murder our friends. It's pretty simple. You've, yeah. you've, you've left yourself one option there, not working with them. <laughs> people who would kill your friends. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, even, Sam, even Sam was laughing at this one. Like it was the first thing he said when we come and produce the show he just went the deal's been done and that was that the deal's been done he just said that to me and it's like yeah that is you know unfortunately her subsequent post doesn't help a lot and i sort of feel a bit sorry i think it's awful where there's like an expectation like there's like bated breath people are waiting for you to do or say something and you're trying to figure out what it is you're going to say and do so i'm empathetic in that regard but yeah i mean it's just comedy i mean your tweet fucking absolutely buckled me what was it about the star wars Oh Same. yeah, well yeah. basically the premise is obviously now, in theory, unlike others actually, she is one of the few people who could choose not to because she can go into any other game. So yeah, since people don't know, she just did the TI, the International for yeah. which is obviously Valve and isn't related to ESL. My joke was, I did like a, a tweet as though I was like Wojnarowski or whatever from the NBA, like breaking, you know, Valve has been sold to the Galactic Empire from Star Wars. Frankie Ward, last year's TI host, explained that because of pre-existing contracts or whatever, you know, she would be working this year's event, despite the largely <laughs> overblown incident with Alderaan. As if people just have seen Star Wars and you hope they can know what I'm referring to, aren't they? It's mm. in the first half an hour or whatever, isn't it? They yeah. blow up with a Death Star spoiler. The joke is, she, she may as well have done a tweet, I will never work with the Galactic Empire or people who want to kill my friends on Alderaan. Yeah, or the Ewoks. Reasons why I will have to allow them to kill <laughs> yeah, my friends on Alderaan. Come on, mate, come on. By the way, it's the problem, though. Frankie is the ultimate example to hold up, aside from the obvious fact, yeah, she's done herself with an absolute cell phone like that. But yeah. also because she is, the be she is the line in the sand. If you're someone, right, who never ever commented on geopolitics, she never judged people for political opinions you never even implied that like who companies work with is something that you consider very important and that you do it for moral reasons if you're just someone where your premise is i like vidya and i like to talk about the vidya games just do it just go keep doing it keep working with whatever company spoiler as we point out on the four horsemen episode if you work in any other game by the way you're already joined by the chinese and you're again you are you're on no great ground so again we all know that this is why virtue signaling will never end because spoiler all those wankers at blizzard and riot are still tweaking they're still tweeting right now <laughs> <laughs> They're tweeting now on angles like, well, ours isn't as bad as theirs. Like, holy fuck, you don't get it. You don't get it because you never got it. This was always just a plaything to you. You were LARPing, and within the LARP, you're the fucking head vampire or whatever, and then they cast out like, you were never really in real life. So the problem is this. If you're someone, though, who has made not just, like, political statements, but if you've ever gone to bat, as in, like, I won't do X or Y, then you have necessitated that people view you through that lens and all other significant moral and political scenarios which are in a similar context mm. as in if you say i would never work in this you're implying with neom and the saudis in the past that does actually imply that if you then work with them in the future you have gone against everything you just said and you didn't believe the things you said because the premise is and this is unfortunately the reason why this deal is the best example the neom deal at the time was a big deal but relatively is tiny compared to this in fact yes. the joke is that's also so convenient isn't it richard blast get fucked up the arse on a neom deal the esl does an even worse deal with the same people and then they're praised 
and allowed to keep all their same connections. It actually shows what a dog shit industry this is. But the joke really is like you're going to think I'm being like like a flippant when I say this. The premise really does go. It's like Frankie went. I have this principle, and I will not under any circumstances change it. And then they just went. Another zero, Mrs. Ward? <laughs> Another zero? And then how many did it take? Well, how many it took? I mean, obviously, this premise, it wasn't literal, but that's essentially what you've chosen to do. So I would just say, again, this is why you the, the classic line will always be invoked. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. In that scenario, by the way, if you really believe it, here's what people don't get. If she actually had it just come out and immediately just said, you know what, in light of what I've said in the past, I don't know how this is going to work out. I'm obviously going to have to sit down and figure this out with my agent and see what we can do with the deals. But actually, yeah, I can't work with this company because, as I said, I, I'm concerned that they would want to kill my friends and that's too much for me. You know what, even despite all the things I dislike about her, I'd even say fair play, fair fuck. She's actually stood well, by what she I mean, meant. It, it, that, that's, that's still a potential outcome, right? I mean, well, then why fucking... Here's the problem, Richard. She yeah. wants to have her cake and eat it at all turns. The joke now is, you're the douchebag and she's the victim for you mentioning that she's an open hypocrite and hasn't done what she said and is clearly setting... Uh, is clearly soft-selling the idea she is going to work with them. Because that's why she's bringing up all this shit about contracts. Yeah, by the way, if you're a fan... Grow the fuck up. You can get out of any contract. She's not an indentured servant for the rest of her life to the Saudi government. All these deals could be broken. They even, by the way, half these half these companies we don't even do fucking contracts with. You have no obligation whatsoever. You just gave your word. And by the way, I would even say this is the key point for some talent out there. If you really do disagree with this, but you feel as though, but I said I'd work at the event in three months. Spoiler, no. You, that Those were not the terms under which you accepted that deal. Yeah. The terms of the deal have changed. You may change your mind. That, that I would, I would consider that enough of an extenuating circumstance. You're entirely with your grounds to review whether you want to continue working with those people. Mm. Yeah, and, and, you know, look, it, it's going to be interesting because I, I also remember, you know, and this is why, uh, you know, I definitely uh, will, will always, uh, you know, be mates with Scrawny. I remember, obviously, he was he's, you know, not somebody who works with ESL. And when the Blast Neom deal went ahead, he spoke up about it. And he, Blast is his work, you know. he gets, People it, don't know, he actually also, fam I think he actually came out and said he was, I, I think, did he, it wasn't non but I think he said he was pansexual. I believe mm. that was the, he, he did a public post mm. about it with the flag and everything. So yeah, people yeah. don't know, because he, I think that's even why he did it, because he'd already put himself on record as like, I represent this. And so to him, I know that was a big deal, yeah, with, with the Blast Neom thing. Yeah. And so, you know, he had skin in the game. It could have directly affected his work. Uh, he openly spoke up about it despite that. And a fair play to Blast as well. They weren't petty or vindictive. They didn't seem to penalise him in any meaningful way. But, you know, it's, it, it's sort of interesting because now the real worry is, okay, they even though people are sort of saying they're not going to buy Blast, what if they do? Now what? You know, that's the other thing I'm worried about. Like, it's like you, you said earlier... When you have this functional monopoly, like it was hard enough to criticize ESL. Like spoiler, I'm a, I'm a tell you guys, right? If you if you think for a moment, by the way, ESL ever fixed their issues when it came to paying broadcast talent, they didn't. They were they would still take for fucking ever to pay broadcast talent. And some of the guys that are literally the face of their show are just owed, you know, months and months and months worth of money that they have to chase down. And some mumbling, bumbling, fucking incompetent who shouldn't have a job basically mugs them off for another month and yeah. that was going on and no one spoke up about it meanwhile if it's a star ladder or a pgl or an epicenter or someone or you know i, I don't think it ever did happen with flashpoint but you know if it was if it's somebody small you make that tweet straight all away media all of yeah, them yeah. yeah you make that tweet straight away where's my skrilla yep. so the the reality is there is already a sort of pressure that is put on you just by virtue of the existence of ESL because of the sheer volume of territory they occupy. And so what now? What can I what what would be normal things that you could say? Who's to say this new management group? Uh, actually, we've noticed some tweets. Um, you were very anti-Neom at the time, and this makes uh, you know our owners a bit uncomfortable, and you are expecting to enter the country for the finals, because they'll be doing events in Saudi of Arabia. Course. That you know, there's uh, yeah. that's a fucking no-brainer, of course. Yep. So what happened? So trust me as well, by the way, regimes like that, you you can just be banned from entering the country over a fucking tweet. Go ask anyone that tried to get into China, you know, like I'm telling you, or Russia, they don't fuck about. So, 
you know, there, there's loads of stuff to potentially come. And as I said, if they do go and consolidate even further and buy Blast, something they're denying, but to me seems an absolute no-brainer because they're clearly thinking in monopolistic terms, you know, then they're... In CSGO, you will never be able to say anything bad about the regime ever again. And the regime, you decide, it can be Saudi gaming or the Saudi Arabian government, which are ostensibly interchangeable. Yeah, I've got one thing to say on that point, because I know people are going to get so lost in the mix. Like This is what people do. Whenever there's a bunch of public statements, instead of using your brain and saying... Right, which person's telling the truth, or would it behoove this person to lie, or what? What you know? Well, how can I reverse engineer what they might mean by that? All they do is they just decide, right, which one of them is telling the truth, and then that guy's just the truth, right? So what happens is people love to bring up things that are said and go, well, look, they said they wouldn't do it, right? As I pointed out to Mick on the episode of the Four Horsemen, when your company has been bought, lock, stock, and barrel, one hundred percent, you have zero control, unless it literally states in the contract. And this would be a very unusual contract that somehow someone who doesn't own any of the company or a tiny fraction has like full operating control and cannot be overruled in this scenario even by maybe even like the board i would imagine by the way the owners can just essentially do whatever the fuck they want that's the point course, yeah. in owning something 100 as soon as that's the case it may well be the case that someone like mick or carmack or apollo who spoiler in the context of what i'm talking about are fucking peons they're like your regional manager if you went into a bank they don't know what's going on at the ceo level they might themselves not have any plans to buy blast or to do any of these things or, do anything, or to even change things but the point is it isn't up to them any day some guy I don't know who he is because that's actually part of the reason they've done it this way whoever it is at the top he can just wake up tomorrow and go guess what first of all all those people are fired and we're going a totally new way they could this is not a joke they could wake up tomorrow and ban women from playing in the SL tournaments that's on the table you idiots like they said they bought it 100% there's no special safeguard your heroes at ESL didn't put some special safeguards in the contract I'm guessing that meant they couldn't do any I'd imagine it's just a fucking standard contract you just bought the company up fully and that's it they're going to yeah. make that now it's true it doesn't actually play to their favor in the short term if they're doing esports washing as it were to do all these things and by the way i'd even say at that point in time why be you could just do the thing in your country anyway so i doubt yeah. they would want to do that it wouldn't really suit them right now but the point is they can so when you see all these people from esl because they're going to keep pretending by the way guys they're in charge when they tell you all their plans understand their plans i mean at this point in time being very little in in the contrast to whoever the top people are what i'd like to know is what their plans are and of course that's the one thing we're never going to find out right now are we it's going to take years to figure that out yeah i mean and and so we can it's a good time to segue into the carmack interview because obviously for the next week or two uh it's just going to be pretty, offensive of course yeah yeah exactly yeah full full court press on the media to reassure everybody including some of the partners that i'm sure have got chips on their shoulder that i already alluded to earlier uh, in the broadcast so i mean look let's um that, there was a, a hltv interview uh which i'll uh, i'll pop uh, if you want a quick thing before we do this i have one yeah. quick side point i want to yeah, make yeah, go on. one thing side i don't point. like about this already it's a bit similar to how they implied like i said earlier that they had all these sort of like restraints and handcuffs when they were esl before and they couldn't do the things they wanted to and we were only mm. being dickheads because you know we were sort of in like you know we were backed into a corner we were we were a caged animal of course we lashed out richard when they do that whole angle right even that's just disingenuous if you know the industry. Oh, like, there was yeah. two parts I couldn't stand about this ESL face it merger. And you sort of alluded to it, but you weren't explicit with it because, like, if people know the story, they know the story. If they don't, it wasn't that big a deal. Face it was the one against the ESL monopoly last yeah. time. So the idea, like I mocked him for it on the show, that Mick, who worked with me at Flashpoint, where the whole fucking MO of Flashpoint was, ESL's business model cannot succeed, as in they can't even make the profit to ever trickle down to the rest, that we must do a separate project unconnected to ESL, and spoiler built into that was, and one day ESL must be destroyed. Then suddenly when he does this deal, he said, actually ESL's, you know, they're not as far from profitability as you'd think, and you know, they have a lot of great things going with their model. It's like, you're selling me our line of shit because you didn't believe that a month prior. Same scenario. I noticed when they announced, Richard, that they were acquiring and face it. They talked about how face it had this fantastic grassroots platform. You would have said ESEA was just as good a month earlier. This is so disingenuous. It's mental. If people don't know, that's like if Pepsi bought Coke and went, and of course, Coke's always been the best caller all along, hasn't it? Like, <laughs> you could fucking, like, this beggar's belief huh, that people just eat this horse shit. Like, those two angles cannot be true based on what we know about these people in the industry. So if they're going to start the project, off with a bunch of lies and retcons where do you think it goes from there it doesn't get really cool and awesome and really truthful four 
years down the line, does no. it? No, I mean, and look, so uh, it, so yeah, it. I mean, like, I'll, I'll, I'll just add a bit to that. Like, there was, there was a, there was essentially ESL and v versus everyone else, right? Like, ESL was the Galactic Empire, and all the other TOs had behind the scenes effectively created, you know, uh, the Rebel Alliance, basically. Yes. And it has it's a its... scenario, Frankie's Lando, you know, they arrived before you did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what can I tell yeah. you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway the uh the um the reality and it's been it's been going on a while it goes way back because you know i, I already talked about how dreamhack uh and and um uh, mlg uh went up against esl and then obviously as more and more people came to the table and then uh, dreamhack got bought by esl and everyone said you know oh, um, oh rather by mtg then later acquired itself like oh they're all traitors and you know it it, it, it was really really stupid behind the scenes like if you ever talk to these people the the lengths they would go to for like you know to to undermine esl and obviously face it well you even nailed it back then dude them. you yeah. even said the joke about that deal was everyone who wasn't in on the esl side of the deal would have been if they'd been given the right terms yeah. that's why they were so salty yeah, they were exactly. like oh fuck if anyone else is getting yeah, no burn ESL. oh can i get in on this oh no yeah. fuck them fuck you yeah. that was almost what the vibe was that they all would have turned court on of course yeah of course and and you know look it's um it definitely a, a large part of what was driving all of that is jealousy just as it probably is now um because esl somehow have essentially held on and looked out but i urge people to go and look at the fucking um finances of esl you can get the quarterly reports remember because they're a public company go look at how much money they were losing it's insane awesome. and so there really was a world where if face it could have got the shit together or blast you know could have just expanded their territory maybe partnered up with a few people and pushed back on esl there was a world where you could have put esl sell under pressure there is there was a world by the world way doesn't exist now before obviously the pole project went tits up there was that was even one of the plans within flashpoint is maybe flashpoint and blast do a counter circuit and like the idea is you have to pick between the two so yeah it was totally possible now as you're saying like there's just one way in it you're either joining yeah. us on now we join us on later that's it yeah yeah <laughs> the deal is done uh so anyway Karl Marx done this interview and there's a few like choice quotes in it and oh. uh I i'm just gonna ask you duncan just Come on. Get, get ready. Get ready with the woo, sir. All right, mate. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to just read you some of these quotes. Uh, where should I start? Because there's a couple of choice ones here. Uh, I'll, I'll just throw this one in. Right. Um, he says, uh, I was not part of the talks for the merger. Uh, but if you look at face it in ESL, it's quite obvious that we have distinct strengths in contrasting areas. And if you put them together, it does become a full package. If you look from a Counter-Strike perspective, it makes sense. But if you look at it from an any game perspective, it makes a tremendous amount of sense. We can offer community tools, matchmaking, anti-cheat, game hubs, online leagues, game festivals and tournaments all under one roof. All of a sudden, it's all part of an ecosystem that you can activate almost overnight, and that's where the value comes from. So, any reaction to that one? It's like matter. I said on Four Horsemen, this one, even that beggar's belief, because you notice when he says that, you could almost imagine ESEA never existed and that they've just acquired... They had all those things! They just weren't as good at it as face yeah. it. That's the joke. He's made it sound like they've just added to it. By the way, ESL, first of all, already had all that functionality. And then secondly, yes. ESEA did all of those things before face it even existed. If people don't know, I was involved with ESEA Premium, the actual pogging thing, existing. I had the <laughs> idea for it in 2004. Spoiler, I haven't even worked there in like 15 years for fuck's sake. So the idea that, like, yeah, again, this is just Carmack's usual way of doing it. Like, Carmack's, like, put it this way. Essentially, Carmack always takes the L and just spins it as a W in some mad way. So essentially what he's admit there is ESL was shitter than face it at running ESEA. But that's now a positive because they've bought their rival because they couldn't do it as well. Like, oh, that inspires Brilliant. lots of fucking confidence. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Yeah, great job. You had the money to buy them. I guess you win. This is the part I want to uh, get into because Valve, um, like, obviously they've not made any statement, not tweeted about it. That's so far so normal. Just another day, uh, another day at the office. Um, you you know, know, that's one thing I found very weird, Richard. You know, everyone else was speculating, like, oh, they must have asked Valve's permission. 
That has not been my experience, and I got a little bit from the Flashpoint scenario and from before when I actually was mates with some of the ESL people. As far as I can tell, if people don't know, my experience goes the opposite, Richard. Valve, essentially, ESL just does what they want to do, and unless Valve comes in, and especially in this scenario, hopefully before a deal's done, so there's not even more pressure, unless Valve sort of comes in and goes, do not do that, ESL just does it. Like, I don't get what this vibe is that, you know, they must have gone and asked her permit. Like, Valve doesn't... Well, if, if, either Valve cares or they don't, and they just kind of, as far as I can tell, gamble that they don't most of the time. Yeah, I mean... Listen, this is, uh, you'll, I think you'll read this quote the same way. Um, they basically, what, the way he frames it is that he doesn't explicitly say they told them. Um, he, he, he doesn't explicitly say that. But then tries to like word it in a way that if, you know, or they, must, they must be okay with it because they would have told us. And it's like, yeah. So, I'll, anyway, it says here, in Counter-Strike, we have a publisher that historically has suggested they don't want a monopoly. I'm not talking only about CSGO. Valve have a philosophy of open market across everything they do, not just CSGO. We're not trying to go for a monopoly. That's a lie. The immediate plan for the ESL Pro Tour isn't going to change at all regarding the number of tournaments or the number of days in the calendar. ESL Pro League is not going to suddenly double in length. Our immediate plan is to open it much more and improve uh as much as possible and if we're being honest with each other there are areas in which we're behind relative to our competitors for instance blast has done highly polished and entertaining broadcasts we need to catch up and that's our immediate focus to actually get back to being an amazing polished well-rounded and entertaining show let me just uh, get the second valve quote and we can combine them um where's is the other quote about valve yeah so yeah, here it is. So, <clears throat> with most big things that we do, we always try to give Valve a heads up about what, what we're doing, how we're thinking, and why we're doing certain things. In these conversations, you see how he's wording it? In these conversations, Valve typically give me the impression that we're free to do what we want or what we think is best for our business, so long as it doesn't clash with the interests of the average Counter-Strike player or fan. They have given us no indication that would happen in regards to our announcement. Now, that does not say explicitly... Really not, yeah. We, we talked to Valve, and Mick did the same trick. Yep, I noticed. So... Here's the reality. If you had talked to Valve and Valve had sanctioned this move, you would be shouting that. You wouldn't be using Gosh. linguistic trick. You can't. You can't do this trick on me. I work with words. Think about when we, during every major, Richard, every major for like the last four years, every mistake, there's always the implication. Oh, Valve mm -hmm. made us do it this way. Notice they're all so quick to tell you that, aren't they? Yeah. But in this scenario, as you say, the idea that if Valve co-signed it, you wouldn't be shouting it from the. Of course, you would. That would be the first thing you'd say. You'd but, go with Valve's explicit agreement. Of course, we did this thing. Just for just for non-English speakers watching the show, right? I'll I'll show you how I've done this and this isn't patronizing or condescending it's it's obviously you might not perceptually pick up on it if you don't if english isn't your first language so first clue that they didn't talk with valve with most big things most the inference there immediately is that's what we usually do but not all the time and most obviously even implying with the majority except this one um we do always try to give Valve a heads up. So with most things, but not all, and not this, we try, don't always, <laughs> to, and, and won't always, to give Valve a heads up about what we're doing, how we're thinking, and why we're doing certain things. In these conversations, those hypothetical conversations in the previous sentence that may or may not happen, depending on whether they, may, they do or do not try, in these conversations, not the conversations, not those conversations that we've had for this instance, Valve typically give me the impression that we're free to do whatever we want so in the past, Valve have said we are. They've given us the impression we are free to do what we want for for our business. So in the past, so again, the inference being we don't need to do it this time or didn't, um, or what we think is best for our business, so long as it doesn't clash with the interests of the average Counter Strike player or fan. They have given us no indication that would happen 
in regards to our announcement. So two things there. They've given us no indication implies that... That, that one's a bit tricky because that even might be lost. On they might think yeah. that means this specific announcement had it, but mm. your point is the track record, the precedent implies there's no, they've no reason this one would be any different to the others, right? Yeah, so they, they have given us no indication. That is not what you say when you've sat down and had an open and frank conversation with, with with someone about a particular topic, and then you it goes on to add that would happen. That's future tense. So no, that that is that is sophistry. That is bullshit. You have not explicitly communicated to Valve you were doing this, and I imagine they are find they probably found out at the same time as everybody else. And so now, what I mean, first of all, there's a broader philosophical conversation to be had about whether or not Valve should be interfering with the ESL's business at all as a game developer. All they do is make the game. So, you know, and at the end of the day, I, I long for the legal challenge that says oh, just, because you made a, yeah, yeah. just because you've made a game doesn't mean you get to tell anyone who wants to run a tournament for that game that you've somehow got your, your the right to stick your fucking fingers in my fucking gumbo. That would be brilliant. <laughs> Deals like this, actually, that's the one upside of them right now. Deals like this actually get us closer to that world where, yeah. in theory, the game devs might have to back off a little bit, you know. They already do it with China in terms of Valve anyway, so they can't be that far. Yeah, so, I mean, listen, you know, we we, we need a, ch a, a, a challenge to, you know, just how broad the purview of intellectual property is. That gives us a bit more freedom and stops us having to live under the tyranny of the god developer. Yes. But whatever. Yeah, that's a totally se separate issue. But, you know, for me, what can Valve do now? Because right, here's that's the, the thing. First of all, you have, to, you have to believe, first of all, that Valve do care. And as I said, unless it's Dota, they don't. Dota is the golden child. All their other properties will... They, it, fuck it. They, they, just, they just don't care. It's not that they don't care at all. It's just that they don't care enough to create extra work for themselves by getting involved with everything. Whereas for Dota, it's worth it because Gabe Newell loves Dota. Yes. That's, that's basically all you need to know. So... The the reality is, I think that Valve can't really do anything. I mean, you need ES. Put it this way: if we agree that esports is good for CS:GO, spoiler, it is. It is absolutely baked into it, like almost no other game out there. And, and, and it is a huge value add to their title that the esports component of it exists. Um, but and they pay for call for it at the moment. Yes, exactly. And the, it, from a minimal investment, we've essentially kept that franchise alive exactly. and much alive, absolutely thriving for 20 years for nothing from them. So, you know, the esports community has done them a huge solid. And obviously that's something that they, they recognize and feel the financial benefits of. So if you then come out now and go, hey, we just don't want to give you the right to use our games because we don't feel comfortable with mon uh, monopolies and we certainly don't feel comfortable with your partnering with the Saudi Arabian government and we're also a little bit pissed off you didn't uh you didn't check with us if any if, if they were to do that then th their game their their business essentially takes a massive hit the reality is esl have always recognized that it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission they've always operated like that and that to me is what they've done here and that to me is what that quote tells me they've done so maybe valve will do something but I don't fucking think so, mate. Not in a million years. I very much doubt it. I mean, I even think the way Carmack phrased it there was very telling because that is the vibe I've got from them. Mm. Basically, as far as I can tell, because obviously with the whole Flashpoint ESL Louvre agreement thing coming up, if you remember, some people were claiming Flashpoint was trying to be exclusive. Some people thought the ESL Louvre thing would be a pr exclusive and make you choose between one circuit or another. Well, in that scenario, the implication I got was that the only thing Valve cared about was that detail, Richard, was that it's not exclusive because, as you say, it's mm. more about how does it affect the random pleb that plays CS? Because yes. for some reason, we are still gaslit by, C by Valve for CSGO that the whole pro scene isn't a massive professional scene that's existed for decades with people who've been in the scene all these time, people who've built up orgs, even brought through talent pipelines, had championship teams, had minor... No, no, instead, we're still pretending it's the wizard from like 1984 and that it's just a bunch of random kids playing video and that they have a big tournament and you know what? The best guy just magically appears in the final and it turns out he was the best player. So that's still what we're pretending Counter Strike is. So as a result, all Valve cares about is the average blend that loads up matchmaking. So as long as basically to become a pro, it isn't like explicitly exclusive. As far as I can tell, Valve doesn't care, mate. Like, yeah, there's nothing and, here that's, that, that bothers them. And, and it's interesting because it, it has now got inarguably worse 
uh, for the from the consumer angle. So Valve are uh, steadfast in their refusal, it seems, to ever fix matchmaking and yes. make it a good uh a, a, a good product in and of itself i mean especially if you're in north america you can go watch vu's video ab ab uh, about this the ranking system is fundamentally broken and globals get paired up with silvers and all sorts of shenanigans yeah. it's just it's just broke the 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 matchmaking experience in north america is is worse than almost anywhere else in the world um so th the idea that they haven't even fixed that or looked into that, or changed that, or tinkered with that, or made a statement with that, or even repudiated that, right? You know, they, 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 that's, they don't care about matchmaking, and unfortunately, that, that essentially is the CSGO experience for a lot, a lot of people. And it's, it's, out, it's out of date now as well, it doesn't feel good, I compare it to when I queue, queue up for Dota, Dota is immense, but far, by the way, but not even the best sort of, like, queuing system out there, Valorant's absolutely kills it uh it, it, you know and and so they, they definitely need to change some stuff but in the meantime don't worry about it because if you're serious and you want to play at a high level you don't have to play matchmaking there's all these plug-in services you can go and basically pay a really small amount for sign up to and you get the benefit of an additional anti-cheat and the benefit of playing with better players and, and and having leagues and ladders and tournaments and all that and valve are like yeah that's brilliant because that is the band-aid for their shit product and so now, you always had two. If basic got too bad, you could fuck off to ESEA. And if ESEA got too bad, you could fuck off to face it. And now, that option's gone. Now, you will get the Atom Smashed Unholy combination of both of those products. Spoiler, they'll probably merge the anti-cheat technologies as well, which now means that private cheat coders only have one anti-cheat to code around, not two, and, and will be able to disassemble the anti-cheat what only once, as opposed to having to do it for two. Uh, so they're loving it. And now you've got nowhere to go. There is no CS pugging system to challenge what, you know, e e ESEA it, is there? So Valve should be, you know, I'm not saying incredulous, but they should be pointing these things out and thinking about these things. It, but they're not. So I mean, seem cross their mind, sadly. Yeah, maybe not. I mean, people in the chat saying e ES portal. It's, it's, that's the Scandic one. And yeah, they've got servers spread out and, you know, it's, it's tiny compared to these two. So, it's like they're not in the same ballpark. Come on, yeah. guys. Like, they couldn't yeah. just scale that up and do the whole world, can they? Like, mm. they've already got Europe and North America now with the ESL. That's the two major regions. Yeah. So, I mean, listen, listen, that, I know, listen, I mean, maybe they'll benefit from an influx if people do want to boycott this new product for whatever reason. Fine. Wait, uh, that's I'll, one thing I've got to say, right? Because obviously yeah. we're going to maybe talk a little bit more about some other aspects of mm. the industry. But, like, let's be real. What this has shown, and this is why Frankie was the ultimate example of this, is that beyond very weird, unusual people who, they're weird now because they have principles they stick to, like me, you, Vince. And that's about the end of the list, by the way. I don't know anyone else that goes on. There's three of us so far in the world, right? Everyone else is just going to be business as usual, as far as I can tell Richard. Nobody, it was all fake. Nobody ever had any principle. Or they, you know what, I'll give them benefit of the doubt. They had principles until a significant amount of their income were invited rested on it and when it did then they know yeah. all the principles so i think everyone else by the way is gonna be fine i don't think here's the thing one thing i always found disgusting about fans deciding one way or the other to judge talent is this thing the dickhead fans still tuned in and watched the game it, it could have even been blast neon they still would have watched you're telling me if it was a blast neon and it was a charles versus navi in the final any fans tuning out no they're not about two, again five fans might do it richard so my problem is this let's just stop like fucking beating around the bush on this Every pro player, ultimately, through their actions, is going to accept this. Every team org is going to accept this. Every league is going to accept this. Every entity, beyond the weird, tiny, niche group of people I gave earlier, is going to accept it. It's all just... Because the problem is, it's too much control, it's too much power, it's too much influence, and it's way too much money. As far as I can tell, this is going to be a start. The joke is what should have been the biggest, like, fucking Avengers Endgame style, shattering the whole scene in half, will actually just be a storm and a teacup for a week. And if I hadn't even tweeted about it as much, probably would already be fucking fizzling out already, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I mean, so I, I talked a little bit about this on my audio podcast, uh, the esports gospel. Which Do you expect real resistance? Spotify. Well, so look, right. First of all, I, I read a I read an article 
uh, on uh, on esports.com where they were saying, ah, bloody esports washing's just the price we have to pay to be in the main I love people but, like that, by the way. Yeah, I know, right? who have to explain why we yeah. do have to get fucked up the arse by this creepy businessman. Like, listen, yeah. just lie back and think of England, mate. Like, you yeah. may as well be saying that at this point in time. No, nah, nah, it's ridiculous. And, and you know, I made that point. But, like, you know, so I don't think people realise that there are cards to be played here. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll underline it just by saying as well, um, Carmack in this interview said, expect us to make make sure that our broadcast is strong. I don't find that we have been ahead of blast in the last year in terms of broadcasting, so we want to catch up. So the cards that you're playing now, if you broadcast talent, is, I mean, first of all, they absolutely have to have a top-notch broadcast, and that requires absolutely the best people. So, listen, all I'm saying here is, f before we even get into the principles of we sh you should walk away from this or anything like that, all I'm going to say is make sure you fucking hurt these rinse people them. financially. Make sure you absolutely yes. rinse them. Because if you're going to take if you're gonna take a little bit of blood money, fuck it. You, you, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. So absolutely make them pay through the fucking yes. teeth if you are going to sell out. Sell out for lots, right? And that, you know, and I can sort of logically get around that i suppose but equally as well if everybody and this is just something that will not happen of course but let's imagine a world where all of the top tier broadcast people say we're just not going to do esl broadcasts anymore and then let's imagine a world where actually the 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 next tier of broadcast talent say well we're not doing it either we stand in solidarity with our you know brothers and sisters and we're not gonna we're not gonna fucking scab and take their jobs and now you've essentially got cunts you've never heard of doing the premium ESL broadcast. And unfortunately, while they might get there eventually up to the level of skill, talent and craft, in the meantime, your rivals, few that they are now, get to fucking level up and get all of the broadcast oh. talent, have a show that absolutely kills yours. Like... To put it in context, again, I'm using a wrestling example. I'm not a huge wrestling fan. I just dabble in and out. But if you look at, right, WWE's had the premium product for ages. Now, unfortunately, Vince McMahon's done probably one fucking Roy too many and his box has gone. And now he, they don't even like to use the word wrestling to describe their product. He, he, they've, they've gone into this world where they he says they're a content provider, essentially. And, you know, he thinks of it in that way. He appointed his fucking son-in-law, Triple H, by the way. He's, his art just fucking popped. Wonder why. Is that, and he hasn't been seen since. There's an internal power struggle. They treat their workers like shit. Won't even let them have twitch channels won't let them unionize certainly won't give them money that they're due to people have left because of the sound yeah, games are going, yeah. What, what are they doing wrong yeah. people people have left um you know the uh on, on the basis of the saudi arabian deal oh, meanwhile okay. aew has just said contracts 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 you know jr's over there fucking jericho's over there. and now they did the first ever pay-per-view that was a non WWE wrestling pay per view that like went past the mill like since oh, WCW okay. in 1995. So that's where they're at. So what I'm, better advantage. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, there is a world where you can hurt ESL and build up. It would be blast in this instance, yeah, yeah. and you 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 know. The you obvious concern is that they do the rug pulling in one year, they just sell blast. Yeah, <laughs> that is the obvious move yeah. that's coming. I will say. Oh no, and I'm almost certain. I'm almost certain it will. <laughs> but maybe, maybe blast wouldn't have to sell. Yeah, I agree. It's a sick product, and they could parlay it into more viewership, more sponsors, and obviously people at home. You know, we're still a broadcast business. Well, first you would and watch foremost. them broadcast for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I mean is as well. If you're ever going to do it, guys, and I know you won't, none of, none of oh, what no. I'm saying that will happen. This is purely saying, These are cards we yes. could play, right? Uh, you know, there's never been a boycott ever in gaming or esports. You all pretend, you all LARP like you're boycott, but at the end of the day, you want to play the shooty shooty bang bang and you want to watch the esports on the weekend in your favorite trip. We know you don't do boycotts, guys. I know you always say, well, as soon as Dorin is hired for the major, that's me out. Yeah, we just broke records. Fuck you. Even if you individually are telling the truth, no one else is, right? So you know what I mean. Power to you being the the lone. You're you're the Richard Lewis of your little social group. Well done. So 
if if people don't watch ESL and people don't make a good broadcast to watch in the first place, so those who watch it start walking away. We are a broadcast industry first and foremost, and ratings do matter, numbers do matter, viewership does matter because you know, sure. They might not need sponsors with all of this cash, but every like all projects like this, sure, they've got the money to lose. That doesn't mean they like losing money. And eventually questions start to get asked. People start to get fired. It might just be as well. They might go, you know what? It was just a bad beat, bad asset. They sell it on. Maybe they sell it at a loss just to get out. It can be done. Even with, because, you know, like I said, to go back to the WWE, AEW comparison, if you were telling me that there would ever be a company ever again that was ahead of WWE in wrestling, you know, after they overtook WCW, I, I, I would have said it's just not possible. But they, they fucked it up so bad and people have refused to work with them because they're such pieces of shit. And now we've got a better secondary product that's rapidly becoming the primary product for true wrestling fans. So there are models out there that work, but I mean, I don't I'm really think... hypothetically, I'm just, again, yeah, no, one no one's going to do it. No, no, yeah, no. back to reality, yeah. People won't even band together to get 100 euros back from these cons. Or as you say, like at the end of the day, here's the case closed on that whole hypothetical. As you pointed out, everyone was being paid late by ESL and they still wouldn't even collectively get together as a group and get paid on time. That's how bad he's... Essentially, everyone, even people who are real-life friends, just essentially turned to each other and went, sad story, but I'm just hoping I get my scratch before you get yours, so I'm out on your boycott. Sorry, son. So, yeah, they just didn't do it. I'd also say this as well. Like, this is the major issue I have for this particular angle, is... That's why I almost say the whole Blast Neon thing, it's almost like it wasn't, as far as I can tell, because too many years ago, that was almost like a genius salvo before this war began. Because not only did you absolutely fuck Blast out of a much-needed partnership, but more importantly, think about this, Richard. I've never seen CS Talent do anything approaching what they did with those public statements. And they did it predicated on the LEC drama like two weeks before or whatever. If that LEC drama never happens, I don't think almost any CSGO talent come out about that topic. I think everyone else just goes, well, I've never given an opinion about politics. I'm just going to stay shut and open. If I work a blast, I work a blast. If I don't work a blast, I don't work a blast. Maybe I do in the future. So I think some people have also, I think that's also why everyone's looking at talent now. But actually, personally, I suspect people who haven't said anything yet are never going to say anything. And they're just yeah. going to work with them. That's just my suspicion, personally. And I should just clarify for the wrestling nerd in the chat. Uh, yeah, sorry, I meant 100,000, not a million. Uh, it's a, it's a, they did 125,000, which was... still a lot of pay-per-view sales if people don't get it. Yeah, I mean, they net something like... Uh, they, they, they're they going to net something like... Uh, well, it's like it's in fucking mil a few million off that. Anyway, regard regardless. So, I mean, look, uh, we could probably put a pin in this talk now i think we've covered all of the bases that we didn't get to cover in the four horsemen um we just gotta kind of wait and see um how it all uh, pans out i'll just also add uh in that interview carmack said when questioned about whether or not well i'll just give you his final answer his final pr answer uh to whether or not being bought by the saudis could in some way come back to haunt esl and he said geopolitics is not my thing <laughs> <laughs> but as I and understand the is it, isn't it? He just cares about Poland, that's it, right? Yeah. But as I understand it, Saudi Arabia wants to shift its economy from oil to something else. Um, we haven't suddenly become a promotion vehicle. This is just shift the shifting of the economy from natural resources to technology. So it's primarily a business investment from a group that wants to be a valuable part of gaming and esports, he said, not answering the question in any way, shape, or form. Right, so let's um, uh, get in. So there was uh, some other news, obviously, in the RMRs. Yes. Uh, because they've changed uh, the rules. Um, and, you know, not major changes, but there are there are a couple uh, that I thought um, are certainly uh, worth getting into. Um, so there was brief hope among Americans uh, because they actually did clarify uh, that um, the... the, the, the nationality rules so people they were saying if you want to compete in a minor in a region uh you have it's the majority of the players that have a passport in that region and and, and they have to you would have to geographically go there so, so they're not under thieves for example would always have to compete in the oceanic one if they existed yes. still the australians 
Yeah, so... Which they always did, but I just, just thought I'd bring it up. You yeah, know. so basically, um, how it worked, how, that gave North American sort of fans hope, because they were like, oh, wow, that means Brazilian teams would have to go and compete in the South American, uh, uh, you know, ma- minor South American RMRs and give more chance to the NA. But then, uh, immediately after that, it was announced that they were sort of consolidating and just doing three regional... Uh, qualifiers with the Americas, Oceania in Asia, and Europe in the CIS region combining, which is a, certainly a spicy fucking meatball based on historical stances from CIS fans. Now, actually, I think that's a personally just to give you my two cents before we get yours. I think that's like a huge positive. Um, it, it gives us a really good, strong region. There's seven legends coming out of that. Seven legends, six challenges, and three contenders coming out of that conglomeration. And with CIS being the strongest region by far in terms of its uh, distribution of talent and the fact that the two teams that are number one and two in the world are from that region right now, I think there's a good chance you fucking dominate that and fucking absolutely break some hearts of some orgs that probably would be thinking they were just going to be able to sort of cruise in in last place. I think that makes that an unbelievably competitive region. And it's also going to really help the CIS who don't get many opportunities. You know, those teams that are down there that, you know, the fifth, sixth best in the CIS region. They don't get to go to a lot of tournaments. They're playing all these online cups and stuff. And now you're going to be playing them at the highest level of competition in a sort of like, you know, format where you're going to get multiple games. So, uh, your initial thoughts to that? I mean, first of all, as you said, it, the reason it's ridiculous is because this is what I always wanted all along. Spoiler, this is how actually we began with land qualifiers. Yep. There was one big land qualifier that was for everyone. Like, that's, if people don't know, famously, Luminosity, which was Fallen's guys before they had Cold Zero and from Brazil, went to the Canavice qualifier for 2015. They made it through. Chad's Renegades team went. They made it through over, for example, like Fetish's Dignitas, a whole bunch of top teams and players that otherwise on paper you would have assumed they would make it in. And the joke used to be, if you'd have held separate minors and Luminosity had made it out of some NA or South African one, South American one, and obviously if the Oceanic one had had Chad's team come out, everyone would have gone, this is bullshit. Wow, you know, the 11th best European team would beat them. So what I would say is this. To me, the reason I always wanted the CIS one folded in is because famously the CIS region with the old legend system never used to have any good teams in it. It used to be won by like the a team that would never make top eight. It was so yeah. rare they ever had any impact. So back then I wanted it so that potentially more European teams could go and take those otherwise useless spots and some arsehole couldn't go. I made a major and then the guy in the 11th best European team's like, well, I wasn't at the major and that somehow carries in your mind, you know, that one's ahead of the other one in his career. The joke for the CIS fans is this. If they'd ever actually believed theirs was the stronger minor, they should have wanted this from day one. Because as Richard just pointed out, yeah. whatever amount there was who could go to, let's say it was four teams could go to the major from CIS. I think that sounds about right. Let's say four teams can qualify. Well, now they can take every fucking spot from the European combined one. If CIS is the number one region, they could potentially take all seven legend spots. They could take all six challenges. They could literally send 13 teams and no Europeans could go. By the way, I love that because I don't give a fuck about regions. I only care about yeah. merit. So I love the idea that, but that either way, whichever region, whichever teams are actually the best from that are hopefully going to be at the major, obviously format withstanding and all the jazz mm. of who wins what games. I think that's brilliant. I think that's a great scenario. I I even think, I don't know now, because obviously we had all these big roster moves, but if you'd have had this system last year, I would speculate, actually, I think some of those CIS teams would have nicked some spots. I think if you look at some mm. of the teams, think of the ones who snuck in at the end, the phases of the world, they would have been fucking nicked by a Fawz or someone who actually, you know, comes in and doesn't have all this bullshit and hype and fake drama, and then they just play in the server, boys, and just beat you. Like, these teams were close anyway, so, yeah, I think it's overwhelmingly a good thing. In general, the closer we can get to not having segregated qualifiers, the better it is because obviously my dream yeah. is it's like if people know the sports are for law I want it to be like fucking tennis where every major tournament has the top 20 players in the course like you see it and then you look at the system of how you get through and generally like you don't have to have this scenario we have in Counter-Strike where it's like oh why like imagine if Face Clan hadn't have been there and a fan goes but why is Carrigan not there but then like 
the people in Entropic are. And it's like, mm. well, they never actually played each other. You're right. There's no actual logical reason except arbitrarily we gave their spot a re an extra slot. And then this one had more slots, but more teams competing. So to me, it's also going to streamline for a fan. It'll make more sense who the good yeah. teams are. There won't be any of this. Like the, the worst example ever, obviously, was like EG at the last one, where where if you oh, remember the circumstances of how they qualified, it's like they barely even had to beat anyone. Like someone forfeited a game and then they had some points from it. And like to explain to a fan why they could be in the top 16 of the major, but everyone mocking them and saying they're going to come 0-3 that's not an easy explanation like you can, that just doesn't roll off the tongue because you have to explain so much shitty context so anything that gets us closer to a real merit based system I think is great for CS I think it's going to be way better for the major yeah they also uh, did um, uh, a change to the way the substitutions work um, which I, I've always had an issue with uh, especially during the COVID era because and the online era because you know in a global pandemic with online competitions and uncertainty about what tournaments go and where, probably that's a rule that they should have like relaxed a little bit. Like you, you know, you might have somebody get sick, so you know that's just something right off the top. But whatever, they they've done it now. So um, basically, you still lose the twenty percent, but you can put the original player back and get no further penalty. That's how they've done it. So I think that's a good thing. I think that's, that's an interesting it. angle. Yeah. Because I mean, obviously, I, yeah, I, one of the big problems if people don't know is when they made that system, they didn't know we would be online for like a year and a half before we had a major. And so the problem with it as well was, if you know anything about how just typically people changed players, like I remember looking at the EU, EU RMR one right before the last one, Richard, and it was like every single team had penalties except like one team. It was yeah. some outrageous. Like at that point in time, the system is fundamentally broken when everyone's just taking two or three player penalties because the idea is you can't just sit for two years without making a bloody player change. Yeah, you won't take any points off but you'll never qualify like your team will just be out of date at that point won't it yeah and, and to be clear that's once uh for the event just to right. clarify but i mean you know i think uh i think that's just a nice little thing there that you can do you know you register your reserve player if you have to use them like you know we're seeing the situation over at mip right now you know obviously if you, you don't want to you know, kind of get fucked over if partway through the the player suddenly gets better and comes back in and, and whatnot. That so. reminds me of a side point I didn't bring up before because mm. I only thought this myself. None of us brought this topic up because we never thought reverse engineer. You remember the weirdest thing about the major wasn't the idea that they reinserted Glaive. Of course you do. Like, they give yourself a better chance to win. It was yeah. the idea that Bobski was the one that went out because actually mm. like he was one of the better players. Obviously mm -hmm. you imagine he's supposed to be part of Astralis in the long term. I actually think if you look at how Astralis dealt with that major it implies they never planned to keep bobski and that they do plan to keep Lockie long term here's why yeah because yeah. they already knew before the end of the major they were going to sell two of their players and device has already gone anyway right so at that point in time if you had have cracked top eight and you were able to use any kind of like a legend spot you'd need the three players well the three players would be glaive zip and Lockie. so it has to be Lockie. if you'd have used bobski and you then sell him you shall lock that doesn't count so i actually think cynically it actually tells you they've essentially just admitted what they were planning the whole time mate i think the yeah. whole exercise of the major was just a lottery ticket that they locked into a top eight spot. It wasn't even that far from happening, to be fair. You could have had a day where you just got lucky draws and that. And if they'd have made the top eight, I think they were already sort of scheming for what to do next. Mm. So the uh, the final part uh, of this is the coach. Um, they've clarified that uh, for RMRs, because remember, these rules only apply to RMRs, um, the only players who are allowed in a competition area during an online match uh, are, are, are the players. I think uh, it's the same as it was in the, I know in the CIS RMR, I think they have mm, the same thing, right, didn't they? Yeah, there are no coaches, staff, or, or anyone else. And honestly, I think it's fucking ridiculous that this has to be explicitly stated. Nothing boiled my piss more than watching, like, Blast, an ESL Pro League where you've got like the entire fucking yep. entourage, like your fucking 80s Mike Tyson in the fucking room with you, all on their phones, giving people back Can't rubs and out some. Is this a fucking tournament or what? Like, because here's the thing if there was a vector for cheating, like it, it would be Most via. The room. <laughs> yeah, it would be via someone yes. with a mobile phone in the fucking room. You, you melt. Yes. So I can't believe they were doing that. And like everyone was like fine with that. Just 
just sort of happened. There's people were using that angle. I know famously Vitality claimed this. They were claiming like it's a way to make it feel like we're on land and there's a crowd or whatever. Which is like that, that's not really a big concern compared to as you say. No, Every God, single no. phone anywhere in a room that visible by any human just increases the chances of cheating like a billion percent or something in there. Like, give me well, a break. But here's the best one. So when it gets to land. The they Valve is still going to allow a coach into the competition area, but get this wording in this rule. Oh, come on. The coach may not be seen, felt, nor heard by the players in any manner outside of tactical timeouts and half-time periods from the start of a map until it is concluded. It sounds like you can sort of go to the, a corner and talk to your coach, but he can't essentially be the coach he was before. Because if you think about it, this almost hooks into the drama of last time where it was you can't clap and you can't be seen to be doing anything. And you yeah, yeah. Restrict. So it sounds like now the joke is, we've, the joke is if people don't get this, this is where people never understand what they themselves are referencing. They've inadvertently almost nailed the exact wording of the fucking Victorian doctrine that children should be like seen, seen but not heard. Not heard yeah. This you know, you're not even seen. It's just like they've yeah. actually almost gone right into that phrase and he even so, I think. I mean, sadly, it's just another chapter involves war against the coaches, isn't it? Which yeah. again, my problem is, I get where they're coming from in their stupid boomer. This is the wizard, the chapter seven version of the world. They do think right, right about the team that's just amateurs starring and could win the major, but don't have a coach. They don't exist, you fucking moron, Valve idiot, fuckhead. Like every team in the world has a coach, and the joke is now you're actually. I've said this a million times. It, it actually serves the opposite purpose, Richard, because here's what really happens everyone does have a coach so whereas actually by us all having a coach we could all get like veteran legendary players who could make up some yeah. of the experience gap instead it goes the other way now if you have Carrigan, Glaive, you know that Fall, a few of the names of the most legendary Agiles, you have an insane advantage. No one else can broach with their money or connections, etc. Because there's only about four of those people in the world are as good as those guys who are going to be in the service. Or yeah. the joke is it actually ends up serving the opposite purpose, as far as I can tell. Look at all these other teams. How many times do you hear about an up and coming team and you find out, oh, they've got legendary players, their coach? Always! It's always the fucking story. That's part of how you bridge the gap. That's part of how you get leveled up. That's how, by the way, in a game, him, someone can give you a call you could never think of a million years yourself because you've never been in a big land match that you would know that this would work like the joke is I actually think rules like that fuck everyone but they even fuck the small team even harder in the long run mm. yeah I, I, it's sort of uh, I mean for me like I, I'm kind of like torn on it because I think the one thing that's pissed me off you know I, I, I'm like you I understand why Valve are doing this and obviously this directly relates to the cheating of the coaches because they think Oh, again, you know, probably not really understanding their own product, essentially, their own eSport. They probably think there is a way that a coach could be sat behind the players and, like, say something, you know, which would give them some ridiculous advantage, some form of cheating. Like, you know, so he would get some external information. I don't know what that would be. I mean, essentially, the only thing I've ever even been able to think of, theoretically, is... That if you were in a, a LAN environment that had a crowd and you uh, and the stage was facing the crowd, you could put a ringer in the crowd to hold something up, a sign, like, you know, that says, like, let's go Brandon or whatever, if they're going B or, you know, uh, like... And and even then, knowing what site they go to, it's an advantage. Sure, it doesn't mean you just win the round. Of course. So, I mean, that to me is like as far as I can get into it. And but the idea that you just have to sit there now, can't show any emotion, you literally can't cheer. You know, we found that out at the major, right? You have to, you cannot cheer with this rule. You can't make any noise in case the cheer is itself some sort of code coded message so i understand why valve are taking these measures and generally i'm for anything that shows up the integrity of the fucking space and you know if 37 coaches hadn't been cheating pieces of shit for years th this probably doesn't happen but it's like you don't nuke cycling because of lance armstrong
Now, that's what I also hate about this. It's like, uh, do they just put uh, the fucking... Do they put premises in a tumbler and just pick one out randomly? So you don't care about ESL running games till God knows what time in the morning, local time, or doing mad shit like having fucking scoffed set up or the internet mm. stuff. You don't care about any of those things which all tangibly affect competitors. You mm. care about some per perceived hypothetical cheating which as yet no one has ever proved publicly ever took place. I know ESL, by the way, I believe them, claim that they have found, you know, people who were like doing cheaters. I will say the idea you didn't publicize that at all is like, well, now I know, don't care what you think anymore then. You cover up cheating because you're a fucking rat. So to me, I get that it's certainly possible and I do think on the law level it would happen. But like to me, I, again, like this is just using a fucking chainsaw to do like fucking microsurgery, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like so. I'm not, uh, you know. I mean, it's it's something. It's there, but also as well. I mean, you know, you look over at Valorant and what they've done and how they've created coaching cubicles, and the coach has their own little space on the uh, on the on the server so they can get into the game and look at stuff. You know, it's like every. I was saying this the other night. That basically, it seems to me that Valorant don't even earn their Ws. It's like other games developers just hand them to them by fucking up their thing. So, you know, like the Overwatch League, I mean, <laughs> fucking laugh about that forever, right? Uh, and, or, and now this, you know, CS is becoming like the no fun game, which is like the thing that we always had over everyone else. So, so anyway, but in general, I'm happy with the RMR rules. One point I forgot to make and just obviously see what you think about this, by having the European and the CIS regions combined, you do get a broader... Uh, it, it opens up to a broader selection of tournament operators, and that means sure. that hopefully we won't get a yes. fucking disgrace like what we had with the Akuma incident at the yes. Epicenter one, you know, because yes. now you don't have to rely on Epicenter as one of, like, three tournament operators that operate in the CIS region. You can now open it to all of the operators in Europe. I'll also throw this out there, even though it's just by the by. If you think about the recent whole drama of the last two years of the HLTV Top 20, we're also now not going to have to have Shiro versus Simple versus Zewu on like, well, what did they do in the RMRs, which at this point are almost impossible to wear? Because, for example, last year, CIS RMRs had more top teams, but then dogshit bottom level teams. European one has an incredible breadth of teams, but then didn't have the top. Like, we don't have to do that in theory. We're all competing in the same tournament, finally. So I'm glad yeah. about that. So, we can get on to uh, roster news. Uh, you talked about Astralis earlier, so we'll get into this. Uh, obviously, Farlig um, has left Fun Plus Phoenix. He's been on the bench for three months. I'm sure a lot of people forgotten uh, that he was out there. Um, and, uh, you know, it hasn't been a happy time for him the past few months because he's still, you know, rated decently i would say within the space but he hasn't been able to get out there and 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 show it since parting of the ways with um with copenhagen flames so i mean for me uh i'm just gonna you know throw this out there obviously i mean farlig in free agency i mean you take him over lucky right it seems to me like an obvious one. Like, the sad thing about this move is if Astralis actually want to make their team better, yeah, you can actually instantly do it. And as you say, it's no buyout even. They're obviously a team that doesn't like to spend money, so you can just get him for free. In he comes. He's clearly better than Lucky. The problem I have is this. If I'm them, I would do that instantly. You even get to then laugh at all of us, because if you know the way Counter-Strike fans work, they will take all the statements we made about the team with Lockie and then do that thing they did to Pasha where they pretend that he was talking about the one with fucking, like, Dennis in mm -hmm. of Kingwin, when he was talking about the one with Queeton, a completely dogshit player none of you even remember. So they'll do that where they're all like, ah, oh, no, Astralis is way better than you said. So to me, this is the obvious. You just take the free W. But this is where, actually, I'm wondering where Astralis' head's at, dude, because to me, the way they've sort of gone out of their way to completely double down on the lucky storyline i don't think this is the end of the storyline dude i think for some weird reason i don't get what it is still i still haven't figured out what the angle is but there's some reason he is essential to their plans in some way so i still feel like they'll try and force him into the lineup somewhere even though to me football manager move you make this move instantly don't you and you forget about the whole lucky debacle and just make him a sob or something you know yeah i mean it's 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 really weird especially as well it, you would think it was a no-brainer because you know they keep getting further and further away from that 10-man lineup that they're always touting so it's like I mean you've got a you've got a Danish player in free agency. He is a primary opera. That's the area you're struggling in. 
Um, he's known to add firepower. That's another area this Astralis is struggling in. Because I don't know if you saw them last time out. Oh, I mean... It's rough, mate. Mate, if, if config doesn't go super saiyan they got problems like, you know everything yep. i said when this team was put together has just been it's just been bore out and vindicated it's actually been worse than i fucking thought yeah uh, it, it would be i yeah. actually thought it'd be a bit better than this yeah like, look i knew they can never be what they were at the fall finals but i thought they'd be like somewhere between you know yeah like, this yeah. team if people don't get it if you were to take all the teams in the world ranked 11th to 20th i think at least half of them beat astralis if they play like the team itself doesn't have like game to game form dude it's like all over the place and as you said firepower being bad mate how are you gonna win without firepower for fuck's sake yeah and and so i mean you know i think that's that but another angle on this might be maybe they don't want to commit to dropping lucky bringing in farling because they they are still dreaming of a reunion with device uh the news um that came out uh is that he's going to be out for several months this was reported on the 20th um and that what they did was they did a short-term deal with Chikinio. Jaquinio not replacing Device, Jaquinio going into the academy side so uh, Fozzy can continue to play in the open position for NIP. And now you have to ask yourself, like, look, it's good Device is taking some time off and it's good that he's working on his mental. Although I will say, um, Nipper, for as supportive as they're being and whatever they're saying positively publicly about it i, I guarantee they're fucking furious with the, the way this deal has panned out because they were on the cusp of elevating themselves to being an elite level team um they had you know an all right run at the major but they did win an event prior to that and now this is just a massive regression because you know device is the sort of key component of the project even, Rumors... i mean even though apparently you know it's based on like mental health issues that was uh, even though they said it was a health leave i think it was implied it was mental health based on his yeah, mental health. etc and i and i saw it, we didn't see it was anything physically wrong with him in the main so i'm guessing it's mental health they even think if the timing was the worst possible to because remember they were at this they'd made it to the semis with him of that fucking iem winter tournament a tournament without navi and mate, they were odds on that they obviously they made the final anyway there, there was a world where they could have won that tournament if device was there so not only did they give up like a free trophy at the end of the year potentially then obviously he didn't play the next tournament and now he's not even playing now. So like, yeah, if I'm them, like, look, I'm sure he ain't happy with Nip. They can't be happy with how it's working out for them either. Like, it's dog shit for everyone right now. Yeah, and, you know, uh, it, it's, there's... Uh, Do you there's, think that Astralis waits it out and maybe he does come back? There's, okay, so how much am I going to say here? So there's rumours uh, circulating that the, that, that he is done with Nip. That, that part shouldn't be surprising, I wouldn't imagine, if you just look at the way the year went. Now, obviously, you know, I don't want to uh, talk out of school. Um, and, you know, people, uh, obviously, like, you know, that's not coming from Device himself. Uh, you know, it's not like I've sat down with him, we've had a cup of tea or anything like that lately. As far as I can tell, he's just offline and, and you know, good for him. That's the best place to be if you're working on your mental um but uh yeah there's a lot of people uh that would be familiar with the situation saying that for him you know the move hasn't worked out the way he wanted a lot of things in his life has changed and he doesn't have the uh, same level of commitment to the project he did at this than, than he did at the start now that could all be bullshit Devi like I think device again. You want to talk about painting yourself in a corner. Remember, he I mean, it's took longer didn't help, did it? Yeah, he he came out and specifically said the reports on both Deserto and uh, one PV dot fr were false, and that he was just working on his mental health. And what wasn't helping was speculation about his future. Sorry, mate. Unfortunately, Nikolai, uh, you're one of the biggest CSGO players in the world. People are going to speculate. Speculation is normal. Uh, so uh, you know uh, that's what i'm hearing that there is some substance to these reports and and that to me it will be devastating for nip it, it will be devastating to device's reputation 
Oh, it can look like a fool if he does it, yeah. Yeah, and and obviously the the the, the place where it, it would almost certainly have to be going now would be back to Australis. Everyone else has made their money moves. So. True. Yeah, the thing that would be brutal about that move to me is this: in isolation, football manager mode. If I'm Australis, I do that instantly. Of course, even by the way, if I ended up like, so let's say, I had to like pay them more money than I even got for device. Even if that was the case, I would do it instantly for the competitive advantage. The problem is this, and this is why, if you device, you cannot win in this scenario, right? Well, if you go back to Australis, yes, it will immediately make Australis a much better team. But here's the problem: I still don't even think you'd be a contender. Like, this lineup has got plenty no. to go for it, but I don't think a device... Here's the problem. People are thinking it's almost like you're rewinding the classic lineup. We're putting, no, we're not putting that team back together. This is a brand new type of team, boys. So if you had device, look, you'll be in the mix, but, like, I don't think you'd be, like, beating Narvi. You're going to win to it. I think, you you know, that just puts you back to, like, five or six sort of role for me. That's, that's where I'd have you. And by the way, Nip ain't that far from that themselves, for fuck's sake. Surely Nip can add a play and do that. You know what I mean? So I, I don't even know that it's that great a move even for him, except in the short term, you know. You know, my, my worry uh, for him is, and like, so I, you know, I genuinely like the fucking dude. And, you know, we, we talk a little bit and known each other a long time. And my genuine worry is, I think what he wants most of all, it's 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 become about something other than the game. Like, you, you, I'm sure as a sports aficionado, you've seen other pros go through this. Like, LeBron James has a bit of this in him. He wants to be loved. He wants to be adored. You know, Djokovic has that. He wants to be liked, totally. right? He doesn't just want to be the best. He wants to be liked and to be the best. But he wants the public... It drives him crazy as well if you yeah, ever get that. It, you know it, and and, and I'm, what worries me is, I think I think he's fallen into this trap. Uh, and, and, I, and listen, I think a contributing factor to why he's probably suffering a bit men mental health-wise is after just years of just adoration from the the fans he got hit over leaving astralis he got hit over fucking his first ever interview with nip because of what he said you know the astralis boys were putting out things that the fans speculated were criticisms of him then the anonymous thing happened in flashpoint and yes, then and, and and he tried to make people love him and say man i was nearly I crying and now and now that held him up to more ridicule and then personal details about his life came out, spawning, you know, really cruel memes, if we're being honest oh, about it. Up. Uh, and he's always had that, by the way, because he's dated someone who's a high profile kind of celebrity in their own right. He's always had that thrown. I think it's been really fucking jarring for him because not everyone has the mental fortitude to wake up every day, just tweet. Hi, everyone. And it's just immediate fucking hate. Uh, not everyone can deal with that. And I, and, I, and I think it's really shocked him to his core. And I think he believes if he can find a way back to Astralis, people will love him again, but they won't. Here's you know? the funny thing I don't think he gets. That's You're totally right at the end there. I don't think he can wind the clock back. I think even Astralis fans, by the way, won't embrace you the same way they once did because you left them. That's just reality. If people yeah. don't get this, I'll give the example I always give. Any, I know it, the reason I love to give this example is because it's the line in the sand. If you're saying, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're a moron, you go, what a terrible example. So when Semler went to the Overwatch League, yeah. And then came back after one year because he didn't like it and the deal was shit anyway. And then came back to a game where he didn't actually even have the in to CSGO initially. He had to build his way back up again. He yep. even had to do new casting partnerships. He was potentially yep. going to partner with people like me. There's all sorts of people out there that were on the table to do this with. He was trying to reinvent himself. You, what you essentially did is showing all your actions. It was a business move and that actually your heart's in CS. That was interpreted by some CS nutters as fuck Semler forever. He's a traitor who left the game. By the way, I can play Valorant on the side anytime I want, but fuck Semler. He's only ever allowed to work in one game. And now forever, he's a cynical piece of shit just doing it for the money, even though objectively that makes no sense in terms of the, what I just said about the business. So sadly, there's a degree to which there'll be some Astralis fans. And here's the kicker. If you don't win, we'll hold that against you. They'll go, yeah, it's you leaving that caused the others to leave. And then the chain, like, there's a million ways this could backfire, unfortunately. I'm with you. I know it feels to him like to, basically... The joke is this, right? I'll use the analogy to obviously my favorite NFL player. I think low key, that's also part of the reason why Aaron Rodgers constantly like 
pitches well, it's held it out at green as, bit. he's going to yeah. leave but he right. always yeah. stays because here's the thing Richard if he goes elsewhere it only works one way you must go elsewhere and you must win the Super Bowl that is it that's the only way anyone will ever love you after that if you stay there though like even if they grumble when he's doing this in the off season, those the the fat Packer fans worship that guy, and that is if you want the validation of your of fans and people appreciate, that's the best place you can be, regardless of the competitive advantage. So I think I can imagine why Device would think that, but I think unfortunately, like it's like trying to put a marriage back together, mate. You can never undo the things that were said and, and done. You can you can build something new, but is it going to be as great as before? Like yeah, to me, I'm with you. Like I. In a temporary short-term scenario, if every other inn is closed, it might be the best competitive advantage for him to go there. But I do think you can never get back whatever he might imagine. Like, if he thinks this is going to undo all the bad PR, it's not really, unfortunately, mate. No, it, fact, it, it, there'll be even people praying on your downfall. Now you're back at Astralis. Yeah, exactly. It, does, it doesn't work like that. And also, I'll just add as well, it's it, it, it when he when he left, he said his primary motivation was to prove that he could be the best player and all the stuff about being a system up or whatever the fuck. There's a lot of hubris in that fucking interview now, wasn't there? That's aged badly. It's aged yeah, badly. I, but look, now I, now I still I still fuck with it, man. I still fuck with it. Like if people, you know, it, it, it you know, again, he's LeBron. You know, you go to Cleveland, you say I'm coming here to win him, you know, a title, and you know that's some that's some gangster shit when you pull it off, right? That's some legendary shit. Like, part the last part of that sentence when you pull it off yeah yeah exactly but this is the thing you've moved to you've moved to nip you've not won the big tournaments in fact actually you bottled one you should have had yep. uh you kind of flopped a bit at the major and what you've actually proven statistically is holy shit you were better off in australis like yep. Turns out you're you're not putting up superstar numbers. Meanwhile, we got Simple, Zewu, Nico, all these other people killing the game. You know, you're barely to be seen anywhere in the rankings. I think you got 11th this time around, which is still good for a veteran of the game. It's still incredible consistency to even be in the top 20. Yeah. But this is a guy who's never been outside of the top five. So all you've really proved, all you've really done is given ammunition to your detractors. And now if you do fucking fold and, and have to go back to Astralis with your tail between your legs, those detractors will never shut up and will always believe they were right. Because oh, the evidence bears it out. Yes. You've given them that. So, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm hoping... Matt, you know, I'm hoping he doesn't do it and I'm hoping he can get to a place where he levels up and basically takes Nip along for the ride for him. But, you know, what I'm hearing behind the scenes is that He's really starting to convince himself that this, you know, a return to Astralis could be the best thing. So, you know, there you go. Meanwhile, while we're talking about people fucking up their careers, uh, did you see Stanislaw's new team? That's it. I saw part of it, and mainly because it's one of the players in, in the team is called Spermy. Yeah. Give me a break, mate. Come on. I know. Stanislaw, lost. you eyes your Why? Here's the thing. On the one hand, I can't he's say Stanislaw's career is totally unlucky because he does have this insane fucking counter rep that doesn't exist outside of the NA Pro scene. That in the NA Pro scene, he really is considered some sort of like Jesus S Messiah figure. Because yeah. if you notice, he never goes, leaves one of these teams, fails, and then builds up another team and challenges them. And then, ha no, what happens every time is he goes, pisses off, does some shitty little project that's not even good like complexity optic it never even goes anywhere but then when daps or someone else has built up another team to like a world-class level they just keep bringing this car out in the fucking crowd every time going whose music is that and then out comes that so what i don't get is it's yeah. like i can't even say he's unlucky rich and even though he has had some crazy like moments of luck in his career, yeah he he's also one of the luckiest players i've ever heard of in counter-strike like it almost beggars belief how different like the pro players perception it is from what i see like, in his career so as much as like it's a joke, like this is just par for the course. He goes from the highest heights to the lowest lows, and now you have to see will he ever come? Will he ever climb out of that sewer again? I guess. I mean, yeah, no. But when you talk about the lowest lows, I mean, it's one I thing. Not like, any of these players. It's what it's it's one thing to end up in complexity. So, by the way, they're they're currently playing right now under the uh, the name Disconnected, and I'll just read you the names of this roster, um, and maybe this will be. A segment that'll you know come back to haunt us because one of these guys will pop off or whatever. But Ghosty, Delta Nine, Silas, 
and Spermy. It's like there's not one recognizable name there. They're currently playing in the ESL Challenger League. They've lost both of their opening matches 2 0, haven't even took a map. If you go look at the stats, Stanislaw's the guy that's fragging out. I'm out. <laughs> as the IGL. Oh. It's like th this is. This is literally like. I, I I don't even know how to describe it. You know, this is almost like you've gone from like he, there had to be an option. He could have gone somewhere. Like you don't have to do this, do you? Like you, what? You can't get another gig anywhere else. It's it, it's insane. It's like playing. It, it's like going from the Premier League to like when you've still when when you're like thirty years old and going to like the Vanarama fucking Conference Division Two or something. It's like the disparity in the level he's playing at here is insane. And you know, I think despite everything that happened with EG, despite his track record, despite the team, like you think they'd be somewhere. Yeah, well, I mean, this. yeah, like, I, I I don't know where it would be. Times are hard in fucking NA, but I mean, look, I'm going to just say this. That new complexity lineup that got put together, JT is not going to get it done. So, return to complexity, you know Jason Lake, you get to work with some young players again. It's like, Stan would be an upgrade on JT, probably. You know. Yeah, but here's my problem. In line with what I said earlier, what fucking talent Stanislaw ever bring up? Did I miss something? He takes other people's proven talent and just in the short term wins with them. That's it. I've never seen him as like that sort of, you know, like a father figure guide. No. Unlock someone's potential. Like I say, if you've got it, he can potentially use, he use you in the short term. And he seems to be a good mid-round caller. It's essentially all he's good at as far as I can tell. But that's the weird thing about his career. Normally, even the big IGLs have that in their locker. Like, well, I can develop a guy. I can bring him through. Blah, blah, blah. That's the one thing this guy's never really done. That's why, like I say, the only way he comes back to the top is, again, someone just reaches down and pulls him up again inexplicably for the hundredth time. There's certain people in NA, Stanislaus, Timmy 2K, they, they just skate past everything. Somehow it never sticks with these guys, no matter what. Meanwhile, I mean, if you are the Dapsers of the world, you fuck up once, mate, you're done. If you're a finesse, you fuck up once, you're done. You're like, give no, me a but, break. But, but here's, here's the reality as well. Like, right, so Daps has had a similar position, you know, he, come back to fucking coach EG, Stan fucks off, he has to play, they don't keep him around, you know, he walked away from Valorant, where he had a gig, and now he's got fuck all, so he's had to go back, he's in a team, they're calling themselves Orglas, like every other non-creative team out there, but Daps has actually got a better roster, and he's a better person. He's probably going to make some of them, yeah, exactly. Mate, he's playing, see, even you all have heard of some of these guys, and I know you don't watch late night NACS like I do, Infinite, Yep. Swisher, who by the way is a legitimate talent, no joke about it. B Wills, uh, uh, Saturn is on that team, he's another legitimate talent, and Minus. So, Daps, Daps wins for all the cuckoldry, Daps wins again. Like everything that happens in their two parallel careers, it's, I always feel like Daps just comes out like looking better, making smarter decisions. You actually start to appreciate Daps' legacy oh, a little sure. bit more, yeah. yeah. So Anyway, uh, and then I think, uh, what was the one? There was one more bit of news I wanted to to talk about. Uh, where was it? Fuck, I had it on my, uh, I had it on my drop down. List. I'm amazed you did the whole talent thing and just for the excuse to do the Newcastle action thing. Richard, they only bloody fucking saying they're going to cut me head off. <laughs> I've been a fan of Newcastle in my whole life and now these bloody, <laughs> you won't believe it, Richard. I know. You're selling that. I mean, I, I, I just, it's obvious. Again, you want to talk about people having jarring times. It's like, when, you know, when people, obviously, like, de when when somebody says I've been getting death threats on the internet, I'm just like, yeah, of course, yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's first that. time. Yeah, yeah, first time, exactly, yeah, first time. It's called you know? mentions, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I've tweeted, my notifications are popping off, exactly. So, obviously, you get death threats. But, I mean, for people who live normal lives where they're not just like, you know, <laughs> every time you sit in front of a screen, it's just a litany of hate in your face. Um, obviously, it is really jarring. So, I, you know, I wasn't going to joke about it because obviously I think Vince is pretty, like, kind of shocked, you know, like, so, like, a lot of people uh, uh, would be. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I, I think, fuck it, I think we'll just get into the, I can't even remember right. what the story was. Um, oh, yeah, it was Entz. That was it. Entz was the last story. What's the story with them? Um, so they brought in Maiden. 
Oh, that's right. Yes. Okay. Now I remember. Yeah, to round out the lineup, which now makes them uh, Snappy, Hades, uh, Dika, Spinks, and and Maiden, uh, Doto uh, going on the bench. So now the last finish holdout on the Finnish org team is gone. Uh, I don't know if you have any strong thoughts about this. I mean, I'll be honest, like, he's a guy I've, like, obviously seen him um, play a few times because he used to be in that Fun Plus Phoenix team that broke up, you know, with, um, that used to have Steco and stuff in it. And, uh, you know, he, I think he's given a pretty decent account of himself in, in a number of games. He's not, like, a lights-out, you know, gangbusters player. But in general, you know, I've seen him have some okay games. I don't think he's like a mega blockbuster signing. I don't think he's going to change fundamentally like how Snappy, um, how Ents operate under Snappy. But I mean, I don't think they need firepower. You know, you got that Sphinx uh, kid. He's he's playing really well. You got Hades, obviously. You know, the 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 real star on the team. So they probably do just need somebody to like round out the lineup and do a uh, give him a bit of glue. And from what I can tell, I mean, Doto was checked all the way out. Every time I saw him play, he was massively underwhelming in this lineup. I don't know if it was a communication issue or whatever. So I don't think they get. I, I think they get slightly better, very slightly. I think it's a decent move. Like, as you say, he was the obvious, but put it this way, if you talk to any players, he was the guy in the FPX team. They were all like, this might actually be a real talent who'll be in better teams in the future, blah, blah, blah. So he was the obvious person I expected at some point to go to a better team. Uh, I think in ends, as you say, they already actually have a whole bunch of good players. In fact, the cool thing now is, unlike other people who might be the IGLs with the experience, but they don't have the pieces to use, Snappy has a whole arsenal of talents now, actually. Like, this is going to be his real chance to prove what he always thought, which was he could be better than an MSL. He could be the ones just behind the Glaives and the Carrigans of the world. It's just he didn't have good enough pieces off for long enough. So you look at this group of talent. Just as you were at the major, you were mixing it up at one point in time. Yeah, some of the players weren't that experienced. I think if you look at this squad, this is another squad where they obviously don't have the biggest budget. It's ends, but you could you could you could break into the top ten if this team does big things. Yeah, it's I a mean, nice little squad. Nothing to hit. Yeah, it's like it's like I say, it's it's there's kind of like an interesting like because we get, there's going to be opportunities as as I keep saying the way things are going, it, it, you know, in that tech the 11th to 20th team there's going to be a lot of people drop out i mean we're going to find out by the way just how good big can be with uh Farthen. obviously at blast they're playing against a beleaguered nip that's going to be a shake-up godsend have made you know great leaps of bounds and they're still going to be in there i think copenhagen flames are going to fall the fuck off the planet and regret not joining complexity og under under nexa who knows ecstatic the team we were memeing on now 17th in the world being accused of fucking dodginess uh and compared to akuma by um what's his name oh shit who was it the cunt who complained about uh a team using five orps against him oh fuck who norbert norbert. norbert okay there you go yeah in one of the most pathetic... It's just hilarious as a complaint. Yeah, you know, well, I've, you're using five... Are you a fucking pub player, mate, you daft cunt? Now, and also the idea as well that, like, do you have to, you have to fucking cheat to beat I his know. team? Like, it's just ridiculous. But then again, I mean, ecstatic have come out of nowhere. We were memeing on last week. But fair play, that cunt, Bird from Sky, right? Who does look like fucking he belongs in the Harkonnen family, right? He fucking literally wrecked him. He, like, did a tweet where he was, like, doing that fucking tapping his head thinking meme and just absolutely destroyed him. I'm actually pulling for this team now. He's made a fan it's of me. Fair yeah, yeah. Oh, mate, I fucking love it. Like, absolute legend, Bird from Sky. God from Sky is the call of an HL TV. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, mate, look at the names that I'm talking about and all the intangibles and all the things that can go wrong. Not to mention, by the way, there are teams in the top 10 who have completely changed their roster and it's not beyond the pos realm of possibility. They flop. So, and, oh. and so, yeah, you, you know, I, I agree. I think there's territory to be gained for a lineup like this. Right then. Viewer questions, as a reminder uh, to those watching for maybe the first time, here's what we do. Uh, if we have a Patreon page and if you give us money, you may ask us a question and we will uh, do our best to answer it. It can be about anything. It's not just eSports. Uh, and so we'll, we get into those at the end of every show. Jerky's Minion. 
much like how Vivaldi composed the four seasons and each of the seasons has its own unique style blended into it, I want you guys to name four players that represent the four seasons from CS. Pretty good. Good question. Okay. Because here's the problem. The obvious way you could do it, which isn't going to be that good, is you could just do it representing where they are in their careers, you know, but I feel like that'll be a bit too limiting for like winter or whatever the fuck. So assuming we're going to go with something like, you know, spring is like vital energy and like rebirth and all that. So mm -hmm. I, let me think. Who would you pick for that one? Yeah, it's got to be someone who's, who's it's like they're, they're trying to do another aspect of their career. I think it works with his career as well. Going to Team Liquid, you know, big, big roster move. You know, joining a team, new a new venture, new life. There you go. So yeah, sh and also if you know his personality, you know, used to be a Bon Vivant or however the fuck you say that, and you know, so definitely shocks for spring. Um, winter is obviously traditionally the one you associate with, you know, slowing yeah, down. Going, yeah, exactly. Yeah, death. The Six end. Maybe. You know, oh, an old good. miserly that's man good. counting his yeah. last goal. Got yeah, is that a good in the one? Got oh, I like that. Oh, I like go. that. Very Dickensian and Duncan. Well done. Um, yeah, that's classic. Uh, and then you've got Autumn. Autumn's a weird one, like because I never know what you're supposed to associate with Autumn because it has a little element of death to it but it's like it's my favorite season i always think about it positively it's, it's a like, romantic aspect to yeah it, right? it's not spring but you know you're getting you're getting away from winter and yes. you know and it's like nice outside for the first time in a while and but it, you know it, it's it's always a tough one yeah people say in the chat you should uh, associate it with harvesting harvesting so you know all the things you planted you're now harvesting you're reaping don't know really maybe that's then bit from navi because they finally reaped the rewards yeah of the, you know the academy system they've bedded him in he's had his chance and now's his season to shine yeah that's really good uh and then summer so summer is obviously the party season the fun obviously season nice the because time. he's hot as fuck <laughs> he got tragically burned and it's going to take months to fucking forget what happened this <laughs> summer and i know what you did this summer there yeah not go. not bad yeah, not bad I mean, summer as well. I mean, you know, obviously the best player in the game, the, the sort of golden beacon. It's not beyond a possibility to have simple as that. But I, I do like your device metaphor, so well done. You can you can have that one. Right. And also, if you've ever seen Russian slash CIS tourists, it's summer wherever they go on holiday. I've seen them go to, like, America where it's piss cold, and they're at the oh, fucking pool it. at yeah. the hotel in flip-flops yeah. and shorts. Like, you are aware it's, like, fucking five degrees outside. Yeah, mate, five... <laughs> Yeah, five degrees. If you're from, <laughs> if, if, you, if you're from like right up there, Siberia, that's like fucking yeah, that, that, that that's insane. Um, okay, uh, Detlef Insomniac, if you could remove all memory of a game you've played with intent of experiencing again for the first time, which game would you choose? It's The Witcher Three for me, not even close. Which yes, three in all the DLC? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, just to be, I'd love to be able to relive that story for the first time because it's one of the most compelling stories fantastic world building great character arcs very adult uh it's just the easy witcher 3 I, and the funny thing is as well like everyone i've everyone i know who's played witcher 3 says that right I'm, I, they all you it's one of those games because it's such a ridiculously long and engaging story the writing in it is so good um uh, you know, everyone, it's, uh, you know, I've talked about it before. There's everyone I know who's played the game, all of my friends that I've talked to about it, they all hit this despondency for a day or two afterwards because it, it, it's because it's a single player game with no procedural generation to it. You can essentially make the world empty at the end because right. you've done everything. You, you know, most people do go to 100% completion in it, I think, because it's like you want to just get back to the world and like, oh, there's one more quest to do and there's one more bit of armor I can get. And then eventually when it's, when it's all gone, it's just really sad. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it's unbelievably sad. So, I mean, I'd love to be able to like go back and fully complete that again uh, without having the memory of having done it before. That would be my, um, so, what, what's that? Uh, sunshine of the, eternal sunshine, sunshine of the spotless mind. mind yeah. yeah. I think mine would probably be the original DSX. 
just a game with a mega mm. storyline. And again, if you, know, great. if you know it, like it's not you know, you, essentially basically. If people don't know, as a game, it was sort of like the movie The Matrix. Like they clearly took loads of cues from that. So similarly, in mm. the same ways, once you know the plot to The Matrix, you can still enjoy the movie. It's a great movie, but it doesn't have the same shock that he has the first time you watch it when he takes the red pill. Or so similarly, in the game Deus Ex, sort of the moments you presented with and the way the conspiracy story unfolds. By the way, mega based compared to now. I need to check it out. <laughs> that, that Metal Gear Solid yeah. Two. They may as well just be about now, by the way. Spoiler. Even at the time, it was like really out there, yeah. sort of like almost Alex Jones level, sort of like fucking paranoid conspiracy. De 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 Deus Ex is one of the games where it was like it tried to present a dystopia yes. and it's just aged so well. <laughs> like it's actually okay? it's, ridiculous. I actually follow accounts on Twitter that are quotes from Deus Ex and Metal Gear Solid. And half the time you can just, tw I, can, I even can tell they do this with the bot. They just tweet it because it just topically applies to like today. Like it'll be some thing about like the US government the way the CIA is like and you're like what the fuck this is too on the nose and it was just from a video game 20 years ago for yeah, real. Mad. yeah really mad so I mean yeah day, day sex another one I mean obviously we're only going to give you give you one I'll just add this as well I'm playing a game at the moment I'm about to finish it for the first playthrough uh and I can't recommend it enough if you like like the old school RPGs like Baldur's Gate and stuff like this it's legit. Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous was like my game of last year. It was so fuck it like the the con the amount of content in it is fucking mega. The storyline, the writing is mega, characters are mega, and you can go back. The replayability is fucking insane. Like just to give you just to give you a thing, right? So at one point, it, it's about a demon invasion. And at one point they unleash this like swarm of like metal eating locusts essentially to sort of terrorize the the one holdout city of humanity right and just as a complete side quest if you know what to do there's three things you can do in the game where you can basically get the queen of this swarm keep it alive then you meet the guy the demon dude who unleashed the swarm and then you kill him, and you take his notes, and then you read the notes. You would do evil, foul experiments on your own people, eat the queen, and then you can become a sentient swarm of locusts. It's like some mad hidden, it's what they call like mythic paths. It's like See? a mad hidden That's thing. That's like some fucking God Emperor June shit in there. Yeah, it's unfucking. fucking uh, uh, mate, I'm just about to do a lich playthrough, because there's one tangent. You meet this lich, and he says, I'll turn you into an undead, all-conquering lich if you want. You, you can just do that. So, mate, it is, it is it is fucking absolutely mega for anyone that loves that stuff, and I will replay that game multiple times, and I've got 120 hours in it already. It's fucking great. Uh, right. Otarian asks, can we find a way to harness the feeling Thorin has when Astralis loses and put it in a pill? And if we do, we can sell it and put whoever sells Viagra out of business. Also, what would be the name of this pill? Would the name be? I mean, look, the fact it's Astralis and you can work in like a blast thing already feels yeah. like an obvious one, you know. Yeah, Gotta yeah. go with some angle on that. Yeah, blast Stratless would actually sick work. Your, sick of your dick falling finally. Yeah. Get your blast on. Yeah. With the bad. Astralis pill from Nihon. <laughs> We're bringing it all back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, BP420. The C device could just go, my shit doesn't work. But then when I came back to Astralis, I took yeah. the pill, yeah. the blue pill, woke up in my bed the next oh, day. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, something like that. So so some, like. Someone in the chat said, Na like, Niagara, like, Nihon, Viagra, okay. combine it. Yeah, there you go. Bad. Yeah, not yeah. bad. Uh, anyway, BP420 says, uh, do, you, do you know if smoking's allowed at Cincinnati Zoo? Because if not, why did they smoke my homeboy Haram Harambe? Harambe jokes in 2022. I like it. Uh, shine. Uh, what is your favourite fast food place? I think you actually did a series of content about this for Summit. Did, I did the, you the, fast beyond food? the Summit. If you want to see like American ones, I think I picked Chick Fil A at the end. Spoiler, mm. just really good in it. If you like it, it's pretty yeah. good. Um, I mean, for me, I, I, like I don't know because I don't like chain fast food as a rule. I'm not a big fan generally. Yeah, it's like I try and avoid that. It's like I don't know. I mean. Like I say, like, and it's always a disappointment, man, because it's like, okay, so here's what happens with almost like every fast food chain, right? 
they fucking start with like a few places and it's like essentially it is home cooked food and it's fucking sick and everyone raves about it and you have to go to this one specific part of the world to even go and experience it there's like five chains in one city or something you know and 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 then it gets that reputation gets positive a big businessman wants to come in look how topical this is and buy it and then they go now we will scale it up and as it scales up the quality gets worse of course like i mean i used to love so i can give you an example from beer i used to love brew dog stuff it's just not the same now that they've like gone into sort of an industrial level of scaling but but back in the day when it was like small batch brews the beer was fucking banging it doesn't even taste the same anymore you know so uh, I, I i i generally as a rule don't eat fast food like i'd, I'd give me I'd, you know give me a fucking good indian or a good chinese restaurant anytime any day of the week uh Lonnie, what is the worst advice you have ever got? The problem with that is I'm not really someone who asks for advice or applies yeah. it from other people, so it's hard for me, actually. That one. I, if people don't know, I'm someone who generally, people just don't even waste their time trying to give me advice if they know I probably wouldn't listen to them anyway. So I'm trying to think what it would be. I mean, the obvious one would just be stuff I didn't apply and would actually have fucked my career. Like, an obvious example would be... Uh, there's a, mil a million times over people have told me to like walk things back or you burned your bridge. And by the way, spoiler, like my approach always got way better results than whatever they were suggesting. Yeah. Like essentially uh, my entire career in esports, people have just told me, just give in, just give in and accept whatever they say. And uh, spoiler, you wouldn't even know the names of the people I'm referring to because they did give in. They sold out for like the minimum possible. Unlike as Richard said earlier, if you're going to sell out, at least sell out for fucking mega bucks. And they has in essentially just compromised everything about who they were so early on. You guys, now wouldn't even know their names it would be a waste of my time even telling you who they are most of them either don't exist in the industry or as some character like Carmack who you aren't even aware was ever a peer of mine because they've been out of the game 10 plus years doing some bollocks in an office moving fucking papers around with a pencil so Put essentially this any way. advice to give in is probably one I think it's generally pretty shit advice to give to people this is just general bad advice and it's definitely been given to me a bunch of times um, stick to what you're good at uh, is possibly some of the worst advice you can ever give another human being. And I had it a lot in esports before I became broadcast talent. No doubt. You know, people used to say to me, you know, oh, you're a real good writer. So first it was, you're wasting your time writing about Counter-Strike Source. And obviously, and you should definitely come over and write about 1.6. Right. And then CGS happened. Right. So it's like I was positioned. I basically ended up at CGS and I got like two promotions in my first week at CGS. And I wouldn't have been at CGS if I'd gone to 1.6 with all you guys, because that was, you know, that, that was my niche. That was what I was good at. And it, it paid off. And it was what I wanted to do anyway. Um, and then it was you should just stick to writing because you don't have any charisma. Yes. Right? And, you, and you will never you, you, you a podcast won't work. You know, you're never going to be like live on three. You're never going to be like DJ Wick. I shouldn't even do, I mean, even though I trained to be a, a broadcast journalist and did that, you know, people were saying to me, you know, you'll never do hosting. If I hadn't got a gig from Robert Orland to do a StarCraft gig, I would never have been a host. I would never have got, gone to Ely. And so generally people always tell you like, stay in your lane, stick to what you're good at, but you ain't going to get good at something unless you go and try something very reminiscent by the way of like the sort of incredulity when michael jordan went to play baseball as if that was in some way like an indictment of him or anyone who would let him try and do it you know what i mean it's like it's yeah. so bizarre it's like you know he's trying something new what's what's the harm you know like it doesn't kill the sport does, doesn't make a mockery of the sport i mean put it this way it's like you know you see all these freak boxing fights that does more damage to oh, the fabric is does more damage to the fabric yeah, yeah. of boxing than somebody trying to get good at something. Classic example would be Kanye West with all the fashion stuff. People just yeah. spent five years going, you're more and what are you doing? By the way, yeah. spoiler, he's made billions now and he's yeah. literally more free than any other fucking commercial artist ever, maybe ever will be. Yeah. Like, it's mental. The joke you know, is so, you were completely wrong. So, I mean, listen, all, all, all I'll say to, just in general to people listening is, you know, like, uh, right, you've got to know what to get out if it's not working. And, and you've got to be brutally honest with yourself about whether or not you're good at something. But stick to what you're good at. It's so fucking ridiculous because you, you, you're essentially closing off potential. You know, why would anyone do that? So, 
Um, Carl, that's a want... red flag. If that's like a friend yeah. of yours who says that, that ain't the yeah. friend who's hoping yeah, the best. Yeah, that ain't exactly that friend. Put you in your place in a way there when they do that, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Even if they sound like they're couching like they're doing you a favor, because as, as you've just said there, me and Richard, unironically, really hard people in the industry tell us like you'll never be anything on camera, like don't even waste your time. And the joke yeah. is, we're now they more all, famous all work... than those yeah. people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and meanwhile, of course, they were all people who worked on camera as well. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, Carve, as you are both big NFL fans, I was hoping to get your takes on the divisional round games. Obviously, the big news was that we saw the GOAT won't be getting another ring this year, crashing out on a heartbreaking last-minute field goal. But will Rodgers come back to Green Bay in the off-season? Or will he finally get himself I'll, I'll a team play. with an elite defence? I saw that was going on the whole time. Uh, let's talk about the NFL. I mean, all dude, right. first of all, these playoff games have been fucking mega. Oh, what, sure. mate? Some of the best in years. You know, I think... What that actually like... the season, though, because think how many amazing games there were in the season and all the yeah. big Monday night games. Yeah. Like, of course, oh, it's bangers. easily been one of the best seasons yeah. in, a, in, in a long time. And, you know, uh, like, listen, so many surprises for me. I mean, obviously, you know, because we talked at the start of the season. I thought the Cardinals were going to run to the Super Bowl. And obviously, they got unlucky with some key injuries and shit. And some things didn't go their way. And that's, that's always a massive factor in NFL if you of followed course. it for a long time. One injury can kill your whole fucking season. Uh, and it's just that's just the sport. But, you know, they, they fell off. But then it's like, how is Cincinnati still fucking... Where you know going strong makes no sense. Man, they almost didn't make it laugh. The people mate, don't know they could have lost like one that game. And Bills in. Chiefs game is one of the cruelest things sure. I have ever seen in the sport. When I think about the season they've had as well, and that is how you get nothing to show for it. That is fucking savage. There's a perfect example of people don't know of where a quarterback can do almost nothing wrong and lose a game. Mm. That's a pretty, yeah. like, what did he do wrong? He yeah. arguably played better than the other guy. Yeah, it was, it <laughs> was, I mean, don't get me wrong, bro. It's like, for, considering I had no dog in the fucking fight, because obviously the Raiders had done, you know, I'm, I was out my fucking seat in that game. That was, that was, was mega. unbelievable. So, you know, three of the last four playoff games decided by like walk off fucking field goals, all with insane play. The, but yeah, the big surprise for me, obviously, was, you know, I had the Packers. I thought, surely they go to the Super Bowl, yes. you know. Uh, 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 now with the state of play, I think forty. I think the forty nine is that beat them. I think that's a weak. I think that's weak sauce. But unfortunately, I mean, like the special, and, and this is so. This is what I wanted to talk to you about. The special teams were to blame this time. I mean, the worst special team unit of of the season overall, and in that game were diabolically bad. I mean, every point in the game that yes. was scored by the 49ers was scored by their special teams. If people yes. But, yeah. he, but, but, he, but here's the thing I want to ask you, because I know you're like ro a Rogers guy. Yeah. So at what point in a career is like, because like it always used to be the defense. Well, they had that this season. And then the special teams are garbage. I thought, no, nah, they've got a decent defense. If you go look at the stat, here's yeah. the real reason why Aaron Rodgers is the MVP of the NFL. If yeah. you go and look it up, you will find something along the lines. It will be in the, in the gist of this. I'm not looking this up now, but off the top of my head. I think their team was ranked 10th in points scored. So they've got the 10th best offense, Richard. And their defense, I think, is like the 15th best defense. Somewhere. Right. That actually means, by definition, you should be just above average. Yeah. They won the most games in the NFL. And he is probably going to be the MVP because, like, the last sort of like seven or eight games, he just didn't even throw an interception. He just every, every game was oh, yeah. almost like a perfect managed game where you just stay within the margins of what you can score and what the other team can score against it. And you just win every game cleanly. Now, in that scenario, right? That's very different from if I just said they won the most games and they were the number one seat. Like, no, that means also the quarterback also had to be the best quarterback for that, for all those conditions to be activated. So here's the difference. I have never claimed Darren Rodgers has never had a bad playoff game. Of course he has. He's a human being. Spoiler, Tom Brady's had some fucking screamers that he won because he had amazing yeah. defences. Yeah. But what I would say is this. This was probably the most underwhelming playoff game he's ever played because this yeah. was an example of where stats can lie. His stats score looked mega mate. I think he made 20 out of 29 throws or something. But if you watch, he didn't make any of the like epic throws he would make to win one of those aforementioned games where you'd make like a, a, someone breaks out the middle of the field or you throw in a double coverage and you get devoted. It didn't do any of that. Like he just made all the basic throws and then also, quite frankly, looked a little bit uninspired. That she didn't even seem like he went for some of the mega ones or he just missed a couple of them. He had a couple he forced and he missed them. I didn't think that was probably his worst game. I thought it was a pretty whack one. Yeah, it was. Excuses. It, it, you don't have to have an excuse. It's a bad game. It can happen. 
Oh yeah, and look, uh, you know, uh, like I say, even even having a bad game, like you know, it's one of those ones where yeah, it wasn't like vintage Rogers rolling it fucking back or whatever and having being flawless, but like he did get let down uh, massively by the special teams unit, and you know, the problem I've always got is though it's like. How many excuses do you give him? I've got an not, angle on this. They're, they're not I've even never, excuses. I've got an angle you know? I've never found yeah. anyone who could ever counter. Yeah, go on. So most people, like, listen, Pro Bowl is a little bit up there because some of that is fans and how popular they are. But generally, like, they tend to pick the best players. All, and all NFL is an incredibly prestigious category, right? And generally, they don't put that very, very wrong. It's not like HLTV where you're like, oh, that guy number like, No, generally, they're pretty on with it, right? I'm not joking. If you saw how little offensive talent Aaron Rodgers has had in his career, it's mental, mate. Yeah, well, Give true. me an example. Who's the best player he's played with on his offensive side of the ball? Who would you say? Whatever. Yeah. Fuck. I mean, that's... Uh... Probably Devontae Adams, I mean. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, he's, he's only he's himself bad. on his second year of being um, all NFL, and I think he's been Pro Bowl maybe three or four years. Max. Yeah. Like that's his best ever he's had. You know when people start listing off all those players, Jordy Nelson, like they, they, these people make like one Pro Bowl in their career, that's it. They've never been all NFL, they've never been close. So what you have to ask yourself is, how are they getting all these touchdowns? Because they have the best quarterback. That's mm. the point. The quarterback can inflate the stuff. I'd even say that about this season. Who the fuck's his offensive core? Right, Devontae Adams, I'm with you, he might be the best wide receiver. After yep. that, there's nothing, mate. After that, it goes to Alan Lazard, mate. That guy, you wouldn't even know his name if he played for a different team. Then you go to, like, the MVS. He can only score on massive deep balls where he outruns the defense. That's it. He isn't a fucking wide, wide receiver at all. Robert Tonyan last season had about 10 or 11 touchdowns. He's not even considered an elite fucking tight end. Like, you've got Aaron Jones as your running back and AJ. Like, okay, those are they're pretty good players. They're running backs. But the first time you've had a run game ever, maybe, for the Packers, not least because you had Mike McCarthy who believed everything has to be a pass. Everyone in Dallas is fully aware of how that guy wins the game. So actually, mm. I think, here's the problem. I genuinely do think Aaron Rodgers is like simple, mate. I think loads of his career it was impossible to win. You couldn't have, nothing you could do would make you win. I'll give you a, a counterbalance here. So mm. the narrative of the box versus Rams game goes like this, Richard. Bloody Tom Brady almost did it again, didn't he? No, he didn't. He had a billion fumbles handed to him and he couldn't win a yep. game off it. He got outplayed by Matthew Stafford who made the big play and won the game. Like, listen, after he was behind Lords, yeah, he did a little comeback. That, like, you have to win the game at the end of the day. You got to win the game I, I, when you I'll, don't. I'll, I'll also, also add, because obviously I watched that game live. And, that, was uh, that was the messiest that, that, of all. That, yeah, that, that, that Rams defence is unfair. Oh, it's it, bullshit it, the players they have. Yeah, of course. It, Fucking outrageous, and is and Brady's the, the fucking books all line. Man, the fuck up, oh, man. Nothing in that particular man. Game the well, fuck I'm up, all. like Von Miller was just fucking clowning on him. Like that's before you even get into it. Get into it. Some uh, injuries, but even so, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah but like now, nah, you just gotta admit it's come on, protect your man. Like Brady was getting fucked. Also, that umpire came in with a massive chip on his shoulder. He's obviously he's obviously an Aaron Rodgers fan because like he gave Tom Brady his first ever penalty for unsportsman like conduct in his whole career. His whole career. The and thing, he, and it was for complaining for being hit. It was rough in the fucking pass. Are you I'm with you. That was a nonsense thing. But he, that's like Alex Ferguson telling me he doesn't get any calls. Like, mate, like I'm not hearing that. I'm not hearing the yeah, royalty. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right? Because I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a Brady <laughs> fucking fanatic. Right? But now, nah, I mean, like, I mean, it was a massively entertaining game, and like everyone, yeah. But like, it wasn't. It's what happened there wasn't predicated on Brady's oh, brilliance, no. essentially. You know, so yeah, it was exciting, but that was just a messy. That was a that yeah. was the clown for yesterting game. If people didn't see, it, it was just both yeah, teams yeah, trying yeah. to throw the game. It seemed like for yeah, about oh, ten minutes at the end, didn't it? For real, all mistakes. Um, let's uh, do the last question. We have got uh, uh, Chingu asks me because about my football manager streams. Where do you rank Ugandan football refereeing in the Corruption Hall of Fame alongside Fergie time and any time Mike Dean officiates an Arsenal match? Can include esports corruption. I've told this story many times. Worst thing I ever saw uh, was uh, at Land 79 and ESWC when the French uh, officials and the French broadcast were just literally openly helping the teams by giving away player positions, not by accident, quite deliberately. Um, and they always deny that they did this, and everybody saw it. Uh, and everybody saw it repeatedly, and even famously Fetch in an interview called them out about it after the fact. So, yeah, I mean, personally, that's the worst thing I've seen in esports. 
Sad I've thing got... is, as well, if people don't know, there are stories like that that to this day people just deny. Like, I'll give you an example. I was once told by actually a very famous French player, oh, yeah, we knew, we actually had a guy who knew about, like, you know, all the flash exploits in CS Source. When I then said as much on the show or publicly, the very guy himself who knew all that stuff and did all the coding came out, like, I didn't know we didn't know any of that stuff. And then yeah. the same player was like, I oh, just lying. It's like, great, another day in paradise and Counter Strike. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, like, basically anything like that. I mean, I was told some stories on an upcoming Reflections, if people watch it. It's one with an old school player. I won't mention the name now. You'll see it soon, where basically he says that, like, funny enough, Torbel, who now works at the top of ESL, selling them out to the fucking Saudis, although that was MTG, obviously, when he was the manager of Team 3D, he was pulling all sorts of shady shit, similar yeah. sort of things. Like, there'd be PCs that were just better at the land centre, and that was only for Team 3D to play on in the qualifier. Yeah. Else allowed to play. You know, they would get to set up for all sorts of fucking stupid shenanigans. What people don't know is, this is why, to me, I was shocked by the scale of the coach abuse, but the idea people would cheat. I mean, I think you're just a child if you thought that wasn't the case. You've never been around people in esports, mate. Same as sports. People who are even great sportsmen will fucking cheat if they get the chance, of course, because the temptation is what gets you it's not the idea you suck at the game people have got to get that stupid casual shout your brain that isn't why you cheat the reason john jones allegedly took steroids isn't because he's not good at mma it's because he's the best and he is a narcissist who cannot ever lose do you know, understand it's the other way around the fact he's the best is why in his mind he must take it because it's never uh, he's never allowed to lose because he thinks he's better than everyone it's actually the opposite mentality so yeah I would just say uh, there's a million stories like that where just people are just sort of mildly shitty at, like how land setups are fucking each other over on the most petty things that shouldn't really be in competition in my opinion where I'm from at least mate you, you, there's, there's a, there's a, you don't necessarily have to act like a gentleman but you have the rules and the etiquette of a gentleman you know you respect your yeah. opponent you don't cheat openly against them at the end you always show some respect for the competition whether you like them or not right yeah all right then so that's that that's all the questions hope we answered them uh accordingly um so that was another episode of by the numbers uh we um are gonna wrap up the show so shout out to our sponsors obviously again uh gonna nord vpn it's the make sure point nord vpn in the chat we'll take you straight there uh it's a two-year deal 74 percent off and uh great to have them on board obviously steel series as well peripheral sponsor you see i'm rocking their headsets they make great stuff uh got an exclamation point steel series and use richard lewis as the referral code for 10 percent off and of course thanks to our patrons our hundred dollar patrons ben akagi carve kathal cred j dubs jerky's minion jeremy Dahl, marcus kiumpa michael Tobias Berners-Gorney and Will the Weed Wrangler and our $50 patrons Adam Ock, Alex C, A. Rama, BP420, Bacon, Canapacito, CMAC1991, Detlef Insomniac, Echo, Fursock, Gerhan Kaya, Frankito, Judas, Miss Alcoholic, Nolan, Otarian, Reykjavik on Steam, Sard Sawar, Shine, Satan, Bitcoin Cash Podcast, Tim Frost, Lonnie, Watch Dodge, Zumba and Zarathenia. That was by the numbers. Uh, we'll see you next week probably. Until then, take care.